Welcome everyone to Comics from the Multiverse episode 258. I am Peter and joining me as always is Matt. TikTok. Yes, talk tech. Why why TikTok? What's what's TikTok? So so Samojo came back on NXT and he, he told Cross, TikTok young champ, and it's the most mm-hmm. threatening use of someone else's catchphrase I have ever heard. And it's been living in my head since Wednesday. Okay, I will. You knew I wasn't going to get that. That that was right. that was super obscure, intentionally yeah. so. Yes, intentionally so. Yes. Yeah. Uh. So yes, welcome to the show. This is the DC Comics podcast. We get together. We talk about the DC Comics we read this past week. Uh, it's actually quite a short list of books this week. Uh, coming up on today's show, we have Supergirl, Women of Tomorrow, issue one. We have the Flash seven seven one, Nightwing eighty one, Catwoman thirty two. Plus, I have a Patreon book, which is last month's Joker issue three, so still fairly relevant. Um, but that's all. That's all the books making a huge contrast in terms of page count to last week. Uh, but luckily, they decided to give us solicits quite early, at least compared to the last couple of months. It feels really early, but yeah. it's a good week for it, so I'm not going to complain. So right. we have September the solicits. That, the fact that it was so uh, few books, I knew they were dropping. So listen, I just know that's how the universe works out. So you say that I, I, I was feel, ready. I feel like Sod's Law has done the opposite. Some months where they'll give us a really quiet week, and mm-hmm. then the following week they'll give us twelve books and solicits. Yeah, that has definitely happened in the past. <laughs> more, more than likely. Yeah, that, there it is. I'm looking for next week. Yes, uh, that's, a, that's a massive. Yeah, yeah we'll, we'll we'll get to next week's at the end of the show. Right? Right now, we're living in the now. Well, except the fact that we're going to be looking to September for a long time. Uh, but we're living in the now. And we shall start the show with everyone's favourite segment. It is the Comixology Top 10, as of the time of recording, uh, which is the usual Saturday time, for the record. Uh, so, number one, unfortunately, is not a DC book right now on Comixology. It is a Planet Size X-Men issue one. Mm. I guess that's a, a special oversized issue that's setting up a thing. Probably. I I have no idea what's going on over at Marvel right now. I'm so behind on everything. Uh, and then X-Men even more so, just because... It's its own corner. And it's, yeah. I, I don't even know what they're doing since... Because uh, Tegman's gone, right? It's just that we're not in a new phase. No, he still has stuff, but it's okay. not... He's not on the main X book. But I still think they're playing in that corner, and they're just, yeah. Okay, okay. Um, number two is a, a DC book, though. Do, would you like to guess what uh, the, the highest selling mm. DC book as of right now in Comicsology is? I'm I'm looking for bat stuff before I say anything. <laughs> there was no bat books this week, at least not yes. mainline. So not a, uh, But let's go, let's go, Supergirl, because it's Tom King and Evely. Nope. Damn. You'll be happy with the result, though. Uh, Nightwing. There's Nightwing. Nightwing yeah, 81 uh, uh. Uh, is, is the second place there. Uh, and there's less DC books this week, so it makes sense that Marvel kind of dominate this. So New Mutants yep. issue 19 is up next at number three. Number four is actually a trade, Immortal Hulk volume 8, because it's on sale, so fair play. Mm. Uh, and then number five is Star Wars 14. I guess they renumbered that again at some point. War. Oh, yeah, a little while back. Um, yeah. You know, they're doing the whole War of the Bounty Hunters, and there's a, a character from the movies they're bringing in, and it's, you know, pulled pulled me in. Um, haven't read anything yet, but, yeah. I'd say it's more pulling you in, then. Pushing me in. Pushing it's, you it's, in. There's, mm-hmm. I can't help it. Pushing you I into did, the, but... to the pit with the giant vagina monster that's going to eat yes. you, like that yeah, chump yeah, Boba Fett. It, 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 you know, <laughs> Boba Fett's not a chump, all right? Chump. Uh, as as he's a champ, chump. As, uh, as you'll find out watching the book of Boba Fett, or not, because you're you. <laughs> that said, in other Mandalorian news, um, Sasha Banks was was on the the short list for best, uh, so, uh, not supporting, best guest actress Emmys. So that's cool. Oh, good for her. yeah, good for her, I suppose. Yeah, uh, I have this to add. Number six is X Corp. Issue two, or X book. No idea what that. I have no idea even what that is. Yeah, uh, number seven. Uh, back to DC. Uh, the Flash seven seven one. Uh, takes that slot. 
Uh, number eight is Alien Issue 4. Uh, which is it's cool, I guess. Although I've still not tried that because of the art. Uh, number nine is Fantastic Four Issue 33. And then number ten is Supergirl Loon of Tomorrow Issue 1. Hmm. So that slots in there. And then just sort of looking ahead to where other DC stuff might fall. Uh, we have... Oh, some Green Arrow trades are still technically in this. But although I don't think they're on sale anymore. I, th- I think they're just still kind of lingering from selling well whilst they were on yeah. sale. But, uh, yeah. Yeah, Catwoman, unfortunately, is down in the low 20s. It's a shame that that's not up near the other books. Well, it's not like they're propping it up, though. I feel it's one of those ones that's more, not even a critical. But, like, everybody that's reading it talks about how good it is. But, you, you know, you can't make people read stuff you can only keep talking about how great it is so yes but the same people who are all talking about how good it is are all going to be the same people us included that are all going to yeah. cry our hearts out when it's cancelled before it's time yep. because it's not that selling said, the ties to batman i think it's pretty safe right now I, don't know. I mean hell for all i know the physical issues might be doing great because it is right. so bad related maybe it's just the digital right. one and it's maybe just this time of the week maybe this was like number two on wednesday but it probably was mm-hmm. because the marvel books probably hadn't like been put into the mix yet but still um there you go that's comments all top 10 not much more to add uh mm. this week so cool um but we do have solicits we have september solicits uh mm. admittedly it's a fairly uneventful solicits there's not a lot of new stuff added in here so it's going to be mostly just running down what we're kind of expecting uh there is at least one cancellation uh to mention so yeah. we will get into it so it's a september 2021 DC Comics solicitations. Uh, starting off with a lot of the Bat books, and we, we kind of knew that Fear Fear State was going to be the big thing, tying them all yep. together uh, in September. It was teased heavily in the August stuff. So, I Am Batman issue one. This is the new John Ridley book, art by Oliver Cowpole. And uh, this is your, your, a, your Jace. I was going to say Ace. It's not a Bat Hound book. Yeah. This is your Jace no. uh, Bat book by John Ridley. So, should be cool to see. It's got a really nice cover here. But two really nice covers. So. Yeah, three. And you got the Capullo. Oh, yeah, there's a lot of covers here for this. I guess they're going all out with the variants for this one. Um, yep. So, no, I need to see. I need to see. Uh, so, you got that. Uh, it was interesting, and I'm going to mention something from my head as well when I say this. So, Batman's double shipping in September. But notably, mm-hmm. the three books that are double shipping over the summer... Uh, Justice League, Wonder Woman, mm-hmm. and Detective are all single shipping in September. Yeah. So your actual book amount, unless you don't read any of those, you only read Batman, I right. suppose, uh, isn't increasing, which is good. It's actually decreasing. And yeah. because this has been treated like an event, I actually kind of like that it's going quicker. Yeah. I Marvel did this with, uh, with Aaron's Avengers. Mm. Like, it would double ship when there was something going on, or they wanted to get through a story or whatever. It would double ship, and then it would go back to monthly, um, which I think is a fine strategy because, like you said, they are only and they're, they're still putting out the same amount of books yeah. at the end of the day. Yeah, so, a less so even overall. Right. Um, well, why I think about this? So, there's two things I like about this. One, I like that it shows that DC are being more willing to do what Marvel does with you know the transitioning. Like some mm-hmm. some books can be single shipping one month and double shipping when it's more relevant or. You know, maybe be on an 18 issue per year schedule, something like that. I think mm-hmm. that's neat. I think that flexibility is good. Uh, but in terms of this, because it has been sort of billed as like a, a bat event, I do, I mean, I've said multiple times that I think events work better when they're not drawn out over nine months. I think they mm-hmm. feel more special when they're condensed to a couple of months. And because you have the other bat books tying in, it means that it's not going on for six months. And which, I mean, th- th- obviously not all tie in to other books last the whole duration of an event but at least the the potential isn't there for something like nightwing to be tied to this for six months it may be tied to it for two months it may only just be one month it may just be one issue that ties in and that's cool but uh it it reduces that risk somewhat i think so that's a batman issue 112 and 113 which are the first two parts of of fear state so that's got there's a nice handy banner at the top of uh the book as well just Mm -hmm. to be clear uh, Miracle Molly is getting a Secret Files issue. So this is something they're doing one a month. They're doing like a spotlight one shot 
Uh, yeah. so this is the third one they're doing. I think we've already had two by this point. Uh, so that is Kulis is James Tynion the fourth rating with art by Danny. So again, the fact that it's Tynion as well makes you feel like no, this feels mm -hmm. like a, a proper tie-in to the main story then, because it's going to flesh out this character that's been the main Bat book. So, uh, um, is Danny's art what looks like uh, that's on the cover? I I don't I don't know. Well, it says covered by a little thunder. Okay, so maybe not. So, so I would probably say not. Yeah. Okay, because if that's how it looks, I'm not gonna be. It's a little too manga for for my liking. Um, yeah, no, it says covered by a little thunder. So I mean, okay. I mean, for all we know, Danny's art might be manga s too. That's so, oh no, I'm looking at, at Danny, and it's more traditional, much what I like. So um, <laughs> it's very, very. I don't, you know. Classic comic book, right? Like you can see, like the uh, who, who am I trying to say? Like the Ditko kind of hard lines oh, okay. with the Kirby. All right. All right. So uh, there's a, a commission. It looks like Danny did with the with Black Canary. That looks fantastic on when you search for on Google. So yeah, that's uh, good. I'm excited now. Yeah, that's cool. Uh, and because it's a brand new character as well, she probably needs this issue to flesh her out mm -hmm. more than, say, some of the other one-shots yep. that some characters get. Not that I won't read them, and not that they may not be great, but uh, th this is perhaps more uh, more needed. And then we have Catwoman 35, got the Fear State banner on there, making it nice and clear. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's cool, not much to add. I'm sure you love the Ivies on the cover. Uh, I do, I like how prominent Ivy's been, but that version cover... Too. Yeah, the version cover is definitely yeah. the better of the two covers. <laughs> Frisian, Frisian's killing it. Um, but I'm not going to be mad at a, a Paquette cover because Paquette does controlled chaos so well. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I do like how involved Ivy seems to be in Gotham right now. So, I'm very happy. Yeah, uh, we got Nightwing 84, which is also a Fear State tie in, although they've not finished the cover yet, so the banner's not there. <laughs> um, no. But uh, it also has a, a variant cover, which looks alright as well. Jamal uh, Campbell. Yeah. Very neat. So, obviously, more more on the uh, Nightwing later. We, we have stuff to say on mm -hmm. that when we get yep. to the book. Uh, Detective Comics 1043, also with the Fear State banner. Uh, and it's, you know, it's Mariko Tamaki and Dan Mora. Uh, so, digging. That mm -hmm. team's still going. I, I think there was a concern because it was double shipping for a bit that it was going to maybe yeah. change or the art, you know, but the fact that Dan Moore was, I mean, I mean, he may have missed an issue, but Dan Moore being back on this September issue uh, yeah. comforts me dearly. Mm -hmm. uh, and Harley Quinn issue seven also got that Fear State banner, so neat. Um, and then Batman Urban Legends issue seven. This does not have the Fear State banner, which makes sense given that it's kind of a collection of different ongoing stories. So this might be the first one that I, I, I skip on this. Because oh. this seems just like a grab bag of stories. So depending on how packed this week is, me saying goodbye to a, a massive book is not such a bad thing. If it's a short week, I'll probably still read it, right? I'll yeah. probably still pick it up. But in the effort of saving time and money, um, the this, again, seems well, just like a grab bag so, so, in the way that the other ones haven't been. Well, since you mentioned that, let me read the... Uh... Yeah. The short descriptions here. So the four stories in Neo Gotham, Bruce Wayne lies murdered in the Batcave. Terry McGinnis, Bruce Wayne's final protege, will travel into the dark heart of Neo Gotham to find out who killed the greatest hero the city uh, ever knew. So, I mean, people who want Batman Beyond stories are probably going to be excited about that. Uh, yeah. Second story in Future State, was there any Future State stories in this now as well? In Future State, Cassandra Kane just wants a moment to enjoy a hot meal. But the magistrate's pursuit of her is relentless. Okay. I, I like the idea of that story, but again, Future State, now you're teaming with it with a Batman Beyond story. It doesn't seem like when the first bunch of issues of this book have been like slice of life in Gotham, right? We had Grifter, we've had Red Hood, and then little smaller stories interspersed. This just feels like, hey, what do we have to fill this with right now? Third story, in a blasted future, the Dark Knight stands alone against the murderous gang threatening his ruined city. So it's the future again. Uh, and yep. then mysteriously there will be a shocker. Okay. And then the fourth story, in the 88, sorry, in the 853rd century, uh -huh. Batman 1 million is a warden that must contain the galaxy's criminals, but today there's a breakout on Pluto. 
Yeah, what's weird about this one is that I think mm-hmm. what this is missing for me, because I, I like the idea of the first two stories, but yeah. I think what's weird to me about this is that one of the things that I liked about Urban Legends is that it was anchored by two ongoing stories, which was the two, yep. it's effectively two miniseries that were just housed mm-hmm. in the book. Right. So both, not, not, they're not being like a proper replacement for either of those, does make me concerned that this is going to be more just like a monthly random little stories book now. Yeah, and that that's to me, and I know that sounds like, oh, more stories is good. Yes, true. However, when you read as much as I do, I'm looking for any break I can get, and when it's a grab bag like this, this is something that I don't get up, I don't have to pick up the week of, you know? Like, because I'm really interested in three out of those four. Like, I, I don't care about the Blasted Feature Dark Knight thing, but, you know, I like the other three enough, but... I like Durban Legends because it was like, this is what's going on in Gotham. That's not Batman. You know, Batman shows up, right? Like he, we've seen Bruce in the Grifter story, and we saw Batman in the Red Hood story. But like you said those are two anchors. This doesn't seem like it's going to have anchors. And being that this is seven, this just could be a lull issue, right? This could be. This could be effectively. It's weird to say this because of the type of book it is, but right. it could effectively be a fill-in issue before the next proper right. story start. Right, uh, so if, if issue eight solicit for October has no mm-hmm. part ones in it, yeah, I would start to be concerned that this book is kind of going away from what yeah. made it work. Because I wasn't expecting to like the book as much as I did. It mm-hmm. was just how good those two main storylines were that right. I kind of oh no, I need to keep reading this. Right. Uh, so I have to admit, yeah, I, I'm less tempted by this issue uh, based on what yeah, it, I, what it says. Because I saw that because I wanted to see who was going to be there, and I and I noticed like. A lot of the the um, they don't have the creators as I said, like they have Lansing and Colin Kelly there, which but uh, I don't uh, see who else, you know. Yeah, they're being kind of coy about it, and Lansing and Kelly are are just fine. Like you know, they're not right. encouraging names. They're not disastrous names either, but they no. don't they're not exciting names. So, yeah. So yeah, that's what I was skimming through this yesterday because I wanted to be all prepped for the show since I have my nieces now and now just keeping them. Uh, busy um so i wanted to i wanted to be ready and have points to talk about and this is the first one that popped up where i was like oh no where's our anthology series this feels like a grab bag which i know seems like they're the same but with the anthology again gotham seemed to be the main character there um or gotham heroes and this just seems like oh you know batman from the future here's four stories of that i mean i will say there's at least a theme because they are all Mm -hmm. future stories in some way right uh, what's kind of interesting is that at least three of them are based on futures we've had before. So you've got DC right. 1 million, you've got Future State, and you got Batman Beyond. It's just that other fourth one that's a little bit just right. random in the future. Uh, so there's a theme, and maybe that's something they want to do. Maybe the, maybe the one after this will be four short stories yeah. with a theme of something else. But like maybe it'll be four Robin stories or something like that. Maybe they could do some sort of wacky idea like that. Mm-hmm. But admittedly, yeah, without creators to anchor me and without the ongoing stories that make it feel like a, an ongoing, I'm less excited. But I will say that Matina cover is quite nice. I'll say that much. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, yeah, the cover looks great. Like, don't. And I love, uh, you know, I love Batman Beyond. But, yeah. So uh, then we have the Fables crossover book, which is mm-hmm. Batman v's Big Bait, a Wolf in Gotham issue one. Uh, story by Bill William, who is the creator of Fables. Uh, and art by Brian Level. Is it? Is that how you press it? Is it just Level? I feel that feels Level, weird. Called call someone so Level or Lavelle, but I don't know if yeah. where the accent goes. But so I wasn't. I don't want to be into this. Uh, just based off of oh, it's Fables and Batman. But then you you throw in the Werewolf of Gotham, and it's a mystery case. So I'm kind of like, man. If I had ever read a single issue of Fables, I'd probably be down to read this on the show, but mm-hmm. I'm not, so I feel like right. I'm all equipped for it. Yeah, so... This is a six-issue uh, mini, uh, for, mm-hmm. for the record. Uh, so that's the thing that's starting in September. Uh, Batman The World Special Edition, this is just the uh, collection of all the different, you know, countries, Batman stories. This was already... Uh, well, no, this is the, the... Yeah, this is the 25-cent one for... Uh, it looks like because it says oh, it's 25 right. cents you're right yeah so this is like a a sampler i is, think oh so this is just the english story presumably maybe but it says the special edition features incredible an incredible tale by azarella and bermeo yeah 
plus looks at some of the stories. Yeah, so, so yeah, so it's a sampler. It's going to be their story because it's the one that's most relevant right. to the audience, and mm-hmm. then some teases for the others. Then okay. All right, cool. Uh, Batman Nightwatch Bat Tech Special Edition. What was this? <laughs> oh, it's another twenty-five cent thing. Okay. Yeah, so it looks like a, a kids kind of style. You know, like like uh, the the kid, whatever the kids line was. Remember that whole thing? Yeah, I understood That's all the words in like. that title. I just didn't really know what they meant together. <laughs> Nightwatch Bat Tech Special Edition. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, Batman Fortnite Zero Point Special Edition again, another twenty five cent sampler of the uh, the mini series, presumably mm-hmm. that's just uh, been been ongoing. Uh, all right, there we get some other things. Deathstroke Ink Issue One. This was announced previously as Joshua Williamson uh, with mm-hmm. Howard Porter on art. Uh, so no doubt we'll be trying this because it's Williamson. Um, yeah, you know, Howard Porter too. Oh yeah, and uh, another Matina cover uh, and the variant there, which is quite pretty. I have to. Yeah. Oh know. man, but that other, oh man, that other variant cover. I think it's the Hughes one. Oh yeah. That that that's my style. It looks like a like a Pulp Fiction cover. You got Canary on there. And I think you're looking. At, well, the next one is the Hughes cover, which is also Black. Oh, Canary. it is. So yeah. who's that then? I don't know. Is maybe that's the Dima Ivano. Yeah, or... maybe. Or Ger- yeah, one, Gerardo of, one, one of the two names that we don't recognize. <laughs> It'll be yeah. one of them. Gotcha. Yeah. I just figured maybe Hughes the style had changed because they're making it so much like a, a pulp yeah. thing. It's just, but... As soon as I saw the next one, I knew yeah. the next one was the Hughes yeah. one. <laughs> no, that makes sense. Yeah. So we got that uh, Aquaman: The Becoming Issue One again. This was announced last week. This is the mm-hmm. uh, the, the Jackson Hyde Becoming Aquaman miniseries. Yep. So yeah, we'll see how that goes. Brandon Thomas and Diego. Uh, Oro Tigu, or Tigue, or however I'm pronouncing that. I apologize. Oro Tigue. Oro Tigue. Oro Tigue. Yeah, I was, I'll go with that until corrected. But uh, uh, although what, what we didn't know about, I don't think, was Black Manta mm-hmm. issue one, which obviously I presume goes hand in hand with this uh, this Aquaman book. Yeah. Uh, so this is story by Chuck Brown um, and art by Valentine De La Rando. So. Uh, yeah, let, let me uh, read this. This is a six-issue miniseries, and this is completely new, so let me read the uh, description here. Following his appearance in the Aquaman 80th Anniversary 100-page spectacular, so something in that's going to lead to this. Good to know. Uh, the Scourge of the Seas now gets his own series. Black Manta is chasing a rare metal with incredible powers, and he's not the only one who wants to get his hands on it. Friend and foe alike. Torrid! is a former ally who has escaped hell, literally, and to answer the call of the metal. But can Manta trust her? Hopefully so, because he might need her help to fend off Devil Ray, a new competitor for the role of the biggest villain under war. So, this is kind of neat. I'm always a bit hesitant when villains are the main character in a book. So, some villains I'm fine with. Uh, the ones that, that ride the anti-hero line, right? Mm-hmm. I don't want to be rooting for Black Manta. I like that he's a full bad guy. Like, he was such a full bad guy that during the whole metal Fallout stuff, he couldn't play nice with, with Luther's and Justice League. So they threw him out, you know? Yeah. Like, I mean, so I, I, I'm so going to read this. I like Black Manta. Like, I, come on. I will say, I at least like that, you know, we had that Mira mini, which the, I remember them billing as the first yeah. time Mira's ever gotten her own book a couple of years ago, and now we're getting this Jackson and Black Manta books. I mean, they're, they're all minis, but I do at least like they're kind of trying different things with the Aquaman mm-hmm. corner of the universe. So, yeah, that's that's neat. And I'm looking up this artist because that name is so familiar. Okay, that's why. Uh, Valentin Landro did the Mr. Miracle story, I think, in yeah. Superman and Metropolis and Superman Worlds of War. In Future um, State? In Future State, yeah. yeah. And he does the covers on the current... Hey, that art um, was nice. Mr. Miracle. Exactly. <laughs> so if we're getting that art, because I know I recognize that name. Um, so if we're getting that art, great. Um, okay. Uh, okay. But yeah, I mean, I'm a little bit hesitant. I mean, this is only a mini, so we'll see. If it ends with him just shanking both of them <laughs> and, he, and maintaining that he's the baddest bad guy, then cool. Um, yeah, try because there's no Aquaman book right now, which is was, I mean I, right. I suppose technically this Jackson book is an Aquaman right. book because it's called Aquaman, but you know what I mean. There's no Arthur 
right. Aquaman book. Right. So and, it's interesting we're getting these two Aquaman minis at the same time. Uh, mm -hmm. And then we got Harley Quinn, the animated series, the Eat, Bang, Kill Tour issue one. This is a six issue mini as well. Yep. Uh, story by T. Franklin and art by Max Saren. So. Yeah. Seems, seems fun. Fans of the show, uh, mm -hmm. I'm sure we'll, we'll enjoy. And we'll get to the controversy after the solicits. I know everyone wants us to talk about the controversy. I don't. This has been done to death, but. We have to talk about it, Matt. Mm. Look. There'll, there'll be discussion of pussy on this episode, and we're just going to have to live with it, okay? <sighs> <laughs> we should have put a parent up, parental advisory warning. <laughs> Start with this. Yeah, 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 should have. <laughs> All right, uh, next up, Suicide Squad King Shark issue one. This is a six issue mini um, with Tim Seeley writing and art by Scott Collins. We did hear about this before. Although, I don't think I remembered it being a mini. I think I remember... I, 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 I was convinced I it was a one shot. Yeah, I thought it was a one shot as well, but it's one of six, so fair enough. Uh-huh. I think there should be there could be some hilarity from a King Shark miniseries. It it seems like I know you didn't watch the Harley Quinn show, but this seems very much like King Shark from the Harley Quinn show. Mm -hmm. Played played by Ron Funches, who's big and scary, but very insecure. Yeah, given the timing insecure. as well, I would say that the more comedic tone of King yeah. Shark and the Suicide Squad movie is probably playing a role yeah. in this existing because mm -hmm. you know this is coming out in September that movie's out in August I think so yep. you know the, the the synergy is is there and and I like Seeley because Seeley can do crazy things but well so um, I mean I also like Grayson that he wrote with King so mm. and there's a lot of crazy stuff in there um, just, just the idea that says King Shark must battle brutal warriors like Queen Tiger King Roach Prince Nematode, Princess Peregrine, and the terrifying Man King, to finally attain his destiny and make his dower dad proud. I, just that lineup of characters, you know. It, uh, I can't deny it. it's an interesting uh, yes. prospect. I'm more, I'm more, I'm more excited for that than the Black Manta book, mainly just because one, Seelie's got more of a proven track record mm -hmm. with me, and two, because I think. King Shark can be more of a funny, sympathetic villain yeah. than than Black Manta can, because Black Manta is just a bastard, right? That's how mm -hmm. uh, Next up, we got Are You Afraid of Dark Side? I still think it's missing the the. Are you afraid of the well, Dark Side? And look at this. <laughs> and look at this cover. Cover. It's definitely an homage. Oh yeah. To the TV show. No doubt. So like, yeah. come on, DC. Yeah, you got Robin. Damien's get the torch, and he's yeah. doing the the, the, the spooky stories of the campfire. For, yeah, submitted for your approval. Yeah, so this is the your your yearly Halloween yeah. eighty page you know collection of short stories horror related. Uh, we got stories by Elliot Callen, uh, Colin Kelly, Jackson Lansing, Jeremy Hahn, Kenny Porter, Calvin uh, Kasolke, uh, Terry Blass, and Ed Brisson. I have to admit, it's not a super exciting list of writers. Ah, uh, this this is an easy skip. Now, I admittedly, think. a couple of them I just don't know, and they could be great yeah. for all I know. But there's no one there pulling me in. Uh, ten dollars is a lot to take a gamble. I mean, if it's a quiet week, is it on like a, a fifth week? No, it's it, not. It's the first. It's, it's on the week first one. Week of, <laughs> it's the, the birthday week, so odds are I wouldn't be there to talk about it, anyways. Uh, yeah, yeah. I said you could do something for your birthday. No, no, no. I'm putting a putting a, yeah, a ban on. I was, no <laughs> birthday celebration. Inching closer to to old age, and I don't like it. <laughs> <laughs> could be worse. It could be Connor. Uh, so sure. always, <laughs> t sorry, Titans United issue one, uh, seven issue miniseries, story by Kevin Scott and art by Jose Lewis. And uh, notably, though, this is mainly well, it's mainly New Teen Titans, but you also have Connor Ken and a couple others, uh, from and Red Hood, uh, yeah, New Teen Titans plus guests, plus guests. Uh, yes. Isn't isn't this single issues of that, uh, OGN? That they were putting out exclusively yeah. on the reader app. Yes, I rem I remember talking about this sounding like it was a, a graphic novel. Yeah, is, yeah. The, is this get? Hold on, let me just read. Let me read the thing. Right, there's mm -hmm. not much here, but then maybe there'll be something. The Titans face their greatest challenge: their own powers. Nightwing, Donna Troy, Superboy, Starfire, Raven, Beast Boy, and Red to kick off a thrilling new case that will lead to their own question. One of their own question. Not only their place in the team. But their very existence. I mean, I'll try it. Yep. Uh, I don't know who Kevin Scott is to 
be excited about the writing. But mm-hmm. I, I, you know, I would like to read a good Titans book. Yeah, it's been a while. Yeah, I would like to. Uh, Joker Volume One uh, collection, sure. The order here's a bit weird. Mm-hmm. Uh, Far Sector full collection, all twelve issues, nice. Finally, yeah. that's good. Other history of the DC Universe, same get collection. Mm-hmm. Uh, Milestone Compendium one, uh, so this is a a beefy, uh, paperback yeah. of thirteen hundred pages. It's gonna have Blood Syndicate one through twelve, Hardware one through twelve, Icon one through ten, Static one through eight, Zombie zero through eleven, and Shadow Cabinet zero, including arcs never before collected. So it is literally, hey, Milestone, don't drop it on your foot, you'll break your something. Yep, this is a one way to get them all out there as quickly as possible. Mm-hmm. Uh, so then we're the rest of the proper DC books. We have Action Comics 1035. Uh, mm-hmm. Nice cover there with Lois and John sitting on the porch, I think. Yep. Uh, Batman 89 issue 2. I'm actually looking forward to these uh, movie books. I'm kind of curious that, about them. That cover is fantastic. Yeah. You got Billy D. Harvey Dent with like, the shadow yep. of Batman making the Two-Face on his face. Yep. It's, it's a nice yep. touch. Uh, no, I'm gonna, I'm gonna looking forward to trying those. Uh, we got Batman Battalion issue four, uh, which is starting later this month, I think. Uh, mm-hmm. if I remember correctly. Uh, so we got Batman the Avengers Continues season two issue four. Batman the Detective issue five. The penultimate issue of that one. Uh, mm-hmm. Batman Superman issue twenty two. Here's where a bit of news hits. This is the series yeah. finale. So Batman Superman is ending with issue twenty two, and. Obviously, it's a fun book, but let's be honest. Jean Lun Yang get put in a book, and it ended about an arc or two later. Does that sound familiar to anyone? <laughs> yeah, it's. Uh... There's there's two writers that associate this with the, in DC. One is Jean Lun Yang, and the other one is, and I'm forgetting her name, but she was right at the end of the New Fifty Two Supergirl. She then got the end of Superwoman and Rebirth. Uh, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm blanking on her name, unfortunately, but. Uh, again, a writer I was I quite enjoy the work of whenever they're putting a book, but it always seems to be just for the last arc before the book gets cancelled. And it's uh Talking about uh that was the Supergirl, that was the Citadel stuff, right? Yes, 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 yes. Okay. That is the stuff. I'm so, gonna I'm gonna find this writer because it's at the tip of my tongue, but I can't my memory recall mm-hmm. is not I wanna uh, say it's like a, it's like two initials and a name, it's not like a two full names. Mm-hmm. Matt's looking yes, I'm for not answers. Finding it. He's looking for answers. Girl. That uh, was the final Superwoman arc. Yeah, it's the Superwoman. Just type super, Superwoman issue like 15. I'm sure it'll. Alright. Haha, I just came up to Citadel story. There you go. Uh, da, 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 da. Let's go. Looking for answers on the comics podcast. Yep. Looking for answers. Connor's burning in the heat right now. His no, this is Kate. Looking... This is Kate Perkins. Kate Perkins. Was? Yeah, Kate Perkins. Like, it's usually Kate Perkins yeah. that's, that she's credited as. That's why I, I knew it wasn't. That's like not a what I was going to say. So it was not at the tip of my tongue. Yes. So, but yeah. Cool. There you go. That was the example. <laughs> um, next up, Blue and Gold, issue three. Uh, Matt's most excited, anticipated thing ever. I'm very, very excited. Uh, Challenge of the Super Sons, issue six, continue to reprint the digital stuff. Uh, Checkmate, issue four. Uh, Bendis and Malieve, of course. Um, because Superman's punching Iron Man, which cool. <laughs> I'm fairly certain that it's not Tony Stark, but we'll we'll see. It would be a shot. You can't say that it's not yet. Uh, we got Crush and Lobo issue four, probably our least anticipated. Th- even though it's Tamaki, I mean it is Tamaki, but yeah, but it's Lobo, and I, you know, Crush and Lobo. But also the art, it's I'm making a new help, and that, that's good art. But yeah, it's a pickle. Uh, DC Horror presents The Conjuring: The Lover issue four. How many semicolons do you need? <laughs> <laughs> well. Um, I might just read this only for the backup because have you have you watched the third one yet, Pete? Nope. Okay. Nope. I'm waiting till uh, I'm reviewing it with Tim. Gotcha. 
Um, I will say nothing in, in spot of not spoiling. So, uh, we got Future State Gotham issue 4. Uh, that's continuing on. Green Lantern oh, issue 6. Good cover. Yep, yep, yep. It's got a, got a, got a yin-yang kind of vibe to it with Sinestro and Joe. Well, I think even the fact that Sinestro's involved is uh, mm-hmm. noteworthy. Uh, given, I mean, he, he was in the first issue at the meeting, but... You know, he's not really been a major no. element yet. Uh, then we have Hardware Season 1, Issue 2. So this is a uh, so Milestone stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, same with Icon and Rocket, Season 1, Issue 3. And then we have Infinite Frontier, Issue 6. The finale of Infinite Frontier. Because uh, keep in mind, this is double shipping uh, yes. for its middle issues. So Issue 1 starts like next month, I think. And then there's two months of double shipping, and then Issue 6 is September. So it's moving at a nice pace. So it's wrapping up uh, in early September. So very much looking forward to the fallout of that and seeing where that goes. Uh, Justice League 68, like I say, only one issue uh, in September, uh, unlike the previous yep. few months. Uh, Justice League Infinity issue 3. Uh, when we have Justice League Last Ride issue 5. Uh, a book which I tried, thought was okay, and then there was too many books the second issue mm-hmm. coming out so it's basically been dropped by us but it you know it exists uh legends of the dark knight issue 5 looney tunes 262 mad magazine 22 mr miracle the source of freedom issue 5 pennyworth issue 2 i forgot they were doing a pennyworth book <laughs> yeah <laughs> uh robin issue 6 that's still going nicely uh the final issue issue 12 of rorschach is out in September, so mm-hmm. uh, that is, should be a big, big deal. Uh, very much looking forward to it. The cover's really cool, simple. Yes. They've all been kind of really simplistic, but really interesting ideas. Mm-hmm. Uh, so should be good. Uh, we got Ruby Justice League issue six. We got Sensational Wonder Woman issue seven. More digital reprints. Shazam issue three. This is the four issue mini tying into the Teen Titans Academy. Return of Neuron. That's uh, pretty big for the magic side of DC. Yep, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> uh, we got Static Season 1, Issue 4. Uh, then we have the final issue of Strange Adventures, Issue 12. But how did how did Rorschach and Strange Adventures end up ending on the same month? Because they did not start at the same time. No, because remember, there was that big layoff because of the pandemic with Strange I guess, Adventures. Yeah, I guess. I, just, I, didn't, then, I didn't realize they were in sync now. So, that's going to be so weird. We're going to lose two of the most interesting books to talk about in the same month. Man, the, the, the tag for the Strange Adventures is very exciting. The tag? What's the tag? Yeah, not the, not the tag, but the, the, you know, what it's about down oh, at the, the bottom. the text. It's lots of text. Yeah. Mm. So. Oh. So, uh, which I'm not going to read, because I don't really want to know too much now. No, no, point. I'm just... Read, reading there, it, it's even though it's the last issue, there's so much at play still, mm-hmm. you know. So uh, that's good writing to me. Uh, we got Suicide Squad issue seven, so that's trucking along. The ambush bug out of my face. <laughs> Suicide Squad get Joker issue three. This is the Azarello and Malieve yep. book. I'll be, I forgot this existed. Uh, mm-hmm. and probably the same reaction I had the first time I saw it is that oh I don't really want to read a Suicide Squad Joker book oh wait it's Azarello and Malieve never mind yeah. <laughs> never mind I'll shut up now I'll shut up uh, then we got Supergirl Woman of Tomorrow issue 4 so obviously that's the Tom King but it's just starting this week and we'll talk about that in a little bit uh, the other movie book that we're looking forward to trying which is Superman 78 issue 2 with uh, you got some more Gene Hackman Lex on the front there yep uh, excited for that. Uh, Superman and the Authority, issue four. The Grant Morrison book, which, again, I've kind of not remembered that it exists yet. I, probably because we've not had issue one yet. Once I've had issue one, right. it'll get implanted in the brain. But, like, look, there's a Eclipso there. That's exciting. Mm, yeah. Uh, I have to, and Yan and Art. I, I, I'm certainly not mm. mad about Yan and Art. Uh, Superman, Son of Kal-El, issue 3, the Tom Taylor Super Superman book. Uh, so that's <sighs> continuing on. Teen Titans Academy, issue 7. The Batman, Scooby-Doo Mysteries, issue 6. The Flash, 774. 
And we have the Joker, issue 7. Mm -hmm. Joker presents a puzzle box, issue 2. Nice House in the Lake, issue 4, which is now like one of the most anticipated books each month. <laughs> so, yeah, so this one seems to be about the uh, person designated the comedian. So I think we were onto something with each of those uh, symbols mm -hmm. being in order of the book. So... Yeah, very, very possibly. And then Swamp Thing issue 7, uh, mm -hmm. obviously super excited for that. Same with Wonder Girl issue 5, you know, just let, let's out these last few books. Wonder Woman 779, again, this is single shipping in September, not double like it had been, so mm -hmm. that is neat. Wonder Woman Black and Gold issue 4, uh, more of the, the distinct art style. And then from there we're on to just the, the collections, uh, which include Wonder Woman by Perez volume 6 is in there. There's a Batgirl of Burnside Omnibus coming out. Yeah. So that exists. Uh, and I also mentioned there was another Omnibus down here. Uh, yeah, the second half of the Mike Grell Green Arrow run, which already has a volume one, uh, which they're calling the Longbow Hunter Saga Omnibus, but this is volume two coming out with the second half. Right. So uh, that's all nice and done, which is cool. So uh, there you go. That's a solicit. Uh, uh, if they, you'd like to add or point out that, yeah. No. I'm just looking through some of these uh, on here. No, nothing. Yeah. Uh, it's a kind of uneventful batch. I mean, we did have a couple of announcements for new things last week, but the, the new things aren't, like, game-changing, like, big new ongoing series or anything like that. There's no mm. earth-shattering announcements in this batch, I wouldn't say so. Uh, Dull, in a sense, but also that's not a bad thing necessarily when we like a lot of the ongoing books, because it means a lot of them aren't getting cancelled or changed, and that's you know, this, this right. is a case of no news is good news. Yes. So, good stuff. That's solicits uh, for September. So let's, let's talk about Batman's sexual preferences now, because oh, <laughs> look, we have to bring it up at least a little bit. If you didn't see this this week, there's an episode of the upcoming season three of the Harley Quinn animated series in which the creators who have said that in the past they've been allowed to do pretty much whatever they want with that with that show, but they were told mm -hmm. to take out a scene in which, which at least made it clear that Batman was performing oral sex on Catwoman. Uh, and I think if it was just that they removed that, I don't think anyone would have cared that much, but it was the quote. It was the it was the reason that was apparently quoted to them, which was heroes don't do that. <laughs> which set Twitter and social media a storm uh and to talk about why heroes do do that and why Batman is selfless <laughs> and 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 would go down on poor Catwoman. And it led to a lot of memes, some of which were quite funny. Uh, you know, uh, you, you know, adding captions to various panels to turn it into a conversation about that. <laughs> One of the ones that did make me laugh was the. It was from the Manipole book from Trinity, where mm. they're all sitting. It's Superman, One Woman, Bruce, all sitting around the table, and John asks a question, and and they respond, "Batman doesn't do that." Mm. And just the the fact that it was so not belonging in such the, a wholesome the the two that cracked yeah. me up is one was just I don't know what book it was from so it's from, it's from an older book because it's Catwoman's in an older outfit but uh, Batman says at least in the you know the captions that were added you know I know every nerve cluster on a man's body and Catwoman mm. says and a woman's too right and then Batman just stands there staring. And then she looks more teary-eyed. A woman's yeah. too, right? <laughs> that made me laugh. The other one made me laugh is someone clipped out a scene from one of the animated movies. I would say Under the Red Hood, but he was talking to Nightwing, I think. So I don't know if there was a scene like this from that. But basically, Batman is explaining why he doesn't kill, right? And so someone's asked oh, him, why doesn't he do that? And someone clipped his response that's just saying, because if I do that... If I let myself sink to that level, I'll never come back. <laughs> oh, boy. Like, it was a fun couple of days on Twitter, and if nothing else, like Scott Snyder said it best, this is better than the debate whether or not Batman should kill the Joker, which he shouldn't, for the record. Uh, 
and everyone says he should is on the wrong side of history. So, <laughs> yeah, so differentiates him from Jason Todd. Yes, and no one wants yes. to be a Jason Todd. No. And if you do, yeah. reevaluate your life choices. I just, and then here comes Zack Snyder kicking the door down four days late. And I was like, dude, go away, please. I'll be honest, just... has, and I'm not just saying this because I obviously dislike Snyder's work, right? And I'm very critical of yeah. these movies and stuff. But it has felt a little bit less funny because it was just, oh, here's an image of it, of him doing it. Uh, but how, yeah, because he doesn't <laughs> understand subtlety, Pete. We've been over this. It's like everyone else, you know, like taking Batman's speech about not killing and making yeah. it sound, or at least just like having the idea in your head so it sounds like he's like he's saying that if he does that to a woman, that he'll go into a dark place in his mind that he'll never yeah. come out of. That's funny. Um, like recaptioning reaction shots to be as if it's him talking about that is funny. Just show, just having an image that you've photoshopped to make it look like he's doing it. It's not. I don't know. It's just crude. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. And and again, just kicking the door back through, going, "I want to participate." Four days late. It's like, ah, oh, dude, come on. Yeah. So. So I. Yeah. I, I yeah, that, and the funny thing about this, though, is that this is way more attention it would have ever gotten had, had it just been mm-hmm. in the episode. And that that's what I feel. That's why I feel like the, the creative team behind Harley, this, this is something like they're I don't think they're as upset about it. And they're sitting back laughing about how much controversy that it's created now, because because that is the spirit of the show. Yeah, I mean, I, it's entirely possible that it wasn't planned, obviously, but once they had it rejected and they got that line. Like it wouldn't surprise me if they yep. if they put it out there because they knew this is actually yeah. like free marketing. We 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 could create buzz yeah. for the show by by having 100%. people talk about this. <laughs> so you know, fair play. Uh, so yes, Batman. I I believe he would do it. Just if we're going to make a stats, and if he doesn't, he should. Well, he is a a you know billionaire that is so used to. Other people taking care of him, so <laughs> off brand. What you say? Not. You said he gets Alfred to do it. Is that what you said? I don't know, I'm not saying that. <laughs> I'm just saying he might. He might not be the most generous. And you know what I mean. Okay. That that said, he he probably has a lot of toys. So, <laughs> uh, there's, there's a few things on that bat belt. Yeah. 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 That's what I'm saying. <laughs> Oh dear. Okay, there we go. We can move on. It, it would be very easy to take this to a critter place, but I'm, we're going to leave it here. I'm going to be mm-hmm. somewhat nice and keep this at least teen friendly. <laughs> I'm going to say he my head for those that are just listening. Well, you're nodding your head. You're agreeing. That, yes. yes. Nodding, nodding. Yes. Sh- shaking implies disagreeing. Like like Matt wants us to go down down the rabbit hole. <laughs> no pun intended. No, I mean, no. <laughs> All right, that's that's uh, let's throw the books, shall we? We shall start off the books with Supergirl one. Yeah. Supergirl, Women of Tomorrow, issue one. I almost said Wonder Woman there. Supergirl, Women of Tomorrow, issue one. Tom King writing with Bill Chris Evely on the art. Uh, this is an eight issue mini. One of Tom King's more prestige style books, yes. uh, which is becoming kind of his trademark at DC. And the premise of this is probably a little different than I think most people were expecting, mm-hmm. which yeah. is it's about this alien girl, this alien, mm-hmm. know, maybe teenager, early teens, whose father is killed on a sort of fairly savage planet where because he was outspoken about his opinion of the local king. Uh, mm-hmm. one of the king's men just killed him in cold blood and she is determined to seek revenge and she wants to hire a killer uh, to hunt down this guy and kill him and in doing so she ends up running into Supergirl who is on a pl- on this planet because there's a red sun and she wants to get drunk for her 21st birthday because she's never had alcohol before at least yeah. most- never had the effects of alcohol before maybe more right, accurate right because of you know the, the Kryptonian stuff that, you know, sorry to say that Superman just usually drinks celebratory, but you'll never see him drunk because, you know, 
-hmm. His body metabolizes the alcohol so fast under yellow sun. So. Yeah. So that's kind of our starting point. And then because Supergirl beats up this, this thug quite easily in the, in the pub, in the, the little tavern. Mm -hmm. Because uh, it's, it's very much an alien western. I think that's very clear. I mean, even the plot is very true grit. It wasn't so... Yeah, so I I was about halfway reading it, and it wasn't clicking with me, but that should come as no surprise, because most of the time, first issue, Tom King stuff doesn't click with me automatically. Rorschach, really, is the only one that I could feel first being like, oh, I this is exactly for me. Um, and it was James. I, I was complaining about it on Twitter, being like, yeah, this is not freaking for me. I'm a little disappointed. Because I it was super hyped, and he goes, "Oh, it's basically true grit. What's not like to what's to not like?" And then it clicked with me, and it made me like it less because <laughs> it's so unabashedly true grit, just with Kara and the rooster Cogburn part. And I get that, but to me, the part that makes Rooster work, especially in the Coen Brothers, I'd have never seen the original John Wayne one. But I, I very much liked the the, the Cohen's uh, True Grit. But what made Rooster work so much for me was that he was this world weary guy that was kind of seen at all, and he's just over it. And so he doesn't care about manners. He doesn't is the world this is a a bitter mean place, and you got to take it out before it takes you out. That's not Supergirl to me. So maybe King's gonna play with that. Well, a uh, bit? To, to be fair, I think that is kind of the point is that. Well, we're we're saying that we can transplant the story and say it's it's based right. on a true grit framework. Obviously, there's big differences between who Supergirl is and that character because Supergirl, like Supergirl's thing here, is not I'm grumpy and want you to go right. away. Supergirl's thing is, yeah, I'm not a hitman. <laughs> I'm I'm kind of a superhero. I don't kill people. Uh, also, I've got like a world to go back and like help saving. Like she she's sort of like pushing her away, but for very different reasons. Right, but for me, Supergirl would even, like, try to comfort this girl that lost her dad. And it's never that. It's it's very much, get away from me. I'm not a hitman. You know? And so that just it felt off for I, Kara. I, I agree, it does. I think, though, the fact that she's went to another planet to get drunk on her birthday mm -hmm. on her own right. tells me that she's not in a great place. Because this is a Kara who's a little bit further ahead than perhaps we've seen recently. Right. Right. So and that's why I said it's it's the first issue, right? But again, before being enlightened that it's basically true grit, and once I saw that and then I saw the formula, I was like, Oh man. I, right, I, now I, I kinda know what to expect. I have to imagine that what it'll go in different places than true grit. Uh but, I hope so. But also the big part of this is going to be discovering why Kara is where she is mentally. Why is she like this right now? I I I I don't have a problem with the with the premise per se. It's definitely a little bit different because you know you, you spend half the issue before you even get to see her. Really, I mean, it's very poignant or, or noted that in the opening couple of pages, King makes a point of having uh, the main character here. She talks about she she mentions Supergirl by name and sort of like teases the ending of the story a little bit. Says, "But I'm getting ahead of myself. Let me go back to the start." And I think that's to make it clear to all of us that, oh no, don't worry, Supergirl's coming and she's going to be a big part of this story. And obviously she's going to be, it's her it's her book, right? It's called Supergirl. Right. But just to appease anyone who gets concerned that we're spending pages and pages like introducing these new characters and and who they are. And I think we're going to have this story where this this bond between this character, whose name I have, I have no idea what her name is, uh, yeah. with, with Supergirl. That... There's a lot of potential there in that bond, just like in True Grit or something like The Last of Us or something like... The relationship Supergirl has with this girl and ultimately, like, finding herself again, I would assume, is going to kind of be the heart of this book. And the idea that Supergirl doesn't have her powers because it's a red sun, and we see that she, you know, she gets shot with multiple arrows by the end of the issue and there's blood coming out and all sorts... This right, is but she also kind of no sells it at one point, so I feel like the Red Sun's effects aren't 
you know, like what we normally see yeah, with sun stuff, where it completely robs them. It's it's not a hundred percent. It just slows her down. But I, I think yeah. the you know, it's trying to show that she's still a badass. Like it doesn't matter that right. she doesn't have like all of her complete powers. I mean, there's that right. funny moment in the bar where she gets like punched, and she's like, "Oh yeah, that's right. <laughs> I'm actually yeah. going to get hurt right and bleed side. here." Uh, right. That's 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 a bit of a pure choice, uh, all things considered. Um. Because I actually, I really like the moment, because Supergirl is, like, trying to not care. She's trying to not get attached to this girl. And there's a mm-hmm. moment at the end when she's trying to talk her out, because she's about to leave on the ship, and she's talking to the girl and saying, like, don't be a killer. Is this wrong? <laughs> don't do that. I have to go. You can't come with me. And it's when the girl, you know, says, you know, you don't understand. Like, losing my father, I lost my whole world. And there's a, there's just that moment. And... Supergirls, like, the art's really good there because, like, Evely captures, like, Kara kind of saying, oh, God. I just relate to that. Yeah. <laughs> the art is top notch. Like, it's, it's Evely. We all know how much I love Bill Cross Evely's art. So, that went without saying. Um, yeah. The expressions, especially here. Uh, like, I, I, I just... I've seen a lot of people be lukewarm on this issue. And while I don't think it's a knockout issue like the first issue of Rorschach mm-hmm. or Mr. Right. Miracle where i do think it's a better first issue than batman catwoman which i'm I'm also really liking now after you know once it's mm-hmm. gone going um and i don't have to even compare it to heroes in crisis i think we all know how yeah. we stand on that, that um, that's his big whiff but like in my experience with king i know not to just write it off after the first issue by now but again i don't know if it's just i overhyped this one because i it is king's supergirl and i had that image as my background for ever once this book was announced, right? So I think the key uh, thing with when it comes to a new King book coming out is that maybe it does work better with some of the characters who are maybe less central to your fandom. So Adam Strange and Mister Miracle. Well, you've, mm-hmm. you know, you've maybe liked those characters before. You're not like they're not like you know the big heavy hitters of DC that you have a lot of opinions on. So you're a bit more open to like a different take you're open to this darker place he's putting them in you're open to the trauma he's putting them through and what in turn happens is that by the time you get to the end of the story all of a sudden you're way more of a mr mr miracle fan than you ever were before mm-hmm. uh you're way more of an adam strange fan than perhaps you ever were before uh by the end of that i mean we're not quite got to the end of that yet but in theory i, I probably would say that i'm going to be more of an adam strange I, fan at the end of that than i was at the start of I, it i would say mr terrific i i feel I missed a, like yeah it's... mr terrific yeah yeah, like, uh, you know, um, he's very good at, at deconstructions. And again, that's why I'm not rushing to be like, oh, this was bad. Because I don't say it was bad. It just, it didn't resonate in the way. And I just feel like Kara feels off. But I'm sure there's going to be explanations. I think, so it's not a total, you know, I'm not going to torpedo the book. Yeah, I think Kara only feels a little off. And it felt like she was becoming more Kara-esque. Or at least she was becoming a more recognizable Kara through... Well, a mood, I suppose, is maybe the best way to say it. Like, mm-hmm. by the time we got to the end, is it was starting to sound more like Kara, but a Kara who was very disgruntled, a Kara who has become right. disheartened by recent events. And it wouldn't surprise me if King does bring in, like, you know, the Rogel Czar stuff a little bit, and like the experience of losing uh, Kandor mm-hmm. and and you know whatever else, if that, if that sort of feeds into things a little bit. But I will say, most be- I've seen a lot of people be lukewarm on this, and I think part of it is because it's such a specific type of story that I don't think anyone was really expecting from what a Supergirl book could be. And I think as a first issue on its own, if you take away, if you didn't know this was going to exist and you just sat down and read this first issue and you just sort of get introduced to this character, which I think it does a good job of telling, because this is a more conventional story than these other big prestige books. I don't think this is, this isn't jumping around and being kind of like a psyche piece in the same way that Mr. Miracle or Strange Adventures or Rorschach no, does. It's more of a straight up adventure. Yeah. At this point. Yeah. And honestly, I think it's a solid first issue in presenting its story. I don't think it's what most people expected of it. And therefore there's kind of a there's almost like I need to wait and sort of have it be proven like what the hook of the story is. Mm-hmm. And maybe that hook isn't quite there yet because it's still just setting up the the true grit style side of it. But I was I was getting some feelings towards the end, but once Kara was starting to relate to this girl, the idea that this girl might bring out Kara's heart again in some way. Mm-hmm. Um, now, admittedly, d- did we have a story before that would put Kara in this place? The last time we really had anything with Kara on her own 
was when she was just getting over being taken over from the uh the the the, the batman stuff when she, when she was right. jokerized mm-hmm. so maybe that'll play into like maybe some of the reasoning maybe yeah, kind of use that. that that could be too but yeah it just it seemed off and i just when it comes to the super characters i feel like trying to make them you know have this kind of don't bother me edge it always rings hollow for me just because of who they are for the most part um, I think it works better with know, Kara because so, Kara's, t- I think, traditionally had a bit more of an attitude than Clark yeah. has. But even then, like, this girl's like, I'm not a hitman, but I feel like she should have been like, how else can I help you? And there wasn't that moment. There wasn't that, like, you know, <laughs> what, what are, what's your other option? And and the girl's, no, I'm not going to rest until this man is dead. Which and I think, goes, and okay, I, I can't help. And I, I think, you know, that that what you're just saying there i think that's the key mm-hmm. thing that is missing but i think it's intentionally missing i think that's the whole point yeah. of the story is that mm-hmm. kara's i mean i'll just say she's lost her mojo for lack of a better term and, yeah. it, and it's going to be her refinding her mojo and maybe yeah. some people I, I hope so and, and maybe some people say oh king's put her in this place at the start of the story so he can tell a story about her getting her groove back but mm-hmm. i mean so many stories so many movies so many everything start with a character in a bad place so they can tell the story and it's because it's a comic book and because it's a character who's pre-established that people, like, it's okay to cut into the middle of where a character is to tell a story of how they get out of it. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Especially when this is a character who's not... Ha- if she if she's had an ongoing book right now and right. and it was still going on and this was meant to take place, like, sort of alongside it or right after it ended or whatever, I can maybe see the mm-hmm. critique. But she's been kind of missing for a while. So, like, there, there's room to explore, okay... Why has she gotten herself into a bad place? Why is she so disillusioned right now? Because, um, you know, when she says I need to go back and be a hero, it does sound a little cynical. It sounds like, okay, that's what I'm doing because that's what I've always been doing, but it's not that her heart's in it right now. So right. I'm curious. And, you know, I, I feel like I'm being, not defensive, maybe I am, but I feel like I've seen the general reaction on social media be a little bit kind of down on it. And I, I read, so I went into it having already had that in my mind. So I kind of went in going, okay, am right. I going to be as disappointed as everyone else seems to be? And I kind of read it and went, there was nothing wrong with this, really. There's, there's maybe some this, like, nitpicky moments with dialogue or something that you could maybe point to. Mm-hmm. But Yeah, I I ignored all that stuff and just went into it. And it was, you know, I'm I'm more picky when it comes to super characters. So, and again, it, it's King and Evely. I have high expectations. So when it, it didn't, you know, hit those high expectations. Again, that's what I mean. I would never say this is bad though, or tell people not to read it. Cause again, it's the first issue. If it, if it, this keeps up and we're halfway through, right. On four out of eight or whatever, then, then I would have more of a bone to pick. But again, it's the first issue. I'm not going to go that hard in rail against it. It's I, just, this is stuff that didn't work for me. To, to um, go with my previous statement of uh, how, you know, by the end of Mr. Miracle, I think most of us were mm-hmm. way more Mr. Miracle fans than we were before. Yeah. I, I, I wouldn't be surprised, because obviously the one big exception to that is Heroes in Crisis, where it kind of, he screwed the pooch on Wally, right? And the characterization of Wally. But it wouldn't surprise... For, for most but, of the uh, let, 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 me, let me finish my point, though. Yeah. I wouldn't be surprised that if this ends up being much like Mr. Miracle, where people who give this a chance and stick with it may actually end up loving Kara more by the end because she goes through a hard time and sort of comes out on the other end feeling more Supergirl than she's ever done before or going through a rite of passage. Because one of the things that I think some of the side characters for certain of the major characters can suffer, like Supergirl or like a Batgirl mm-hmm. or like a whoever, is that they kind of get trapped by being attached to the other character and not having their own story and journey, by not having their own arch nemesis, not having their own times that we can kind of point to and say that was their their thing and they don't have enough of their own solo you know because superman and batman there's so many single trades and collections and stories we can point mm-hmm. to and say those are the defining stories of those characters and i don't know if some of these characters like supergirl have as many of those specifically they have runs that we enjoy they have things that we really like but i don't know if there's a i mean the one that i would probably give to someone which is very out of continuity obviously but is, is being super because it's a really good standalone yeah supergirl story but that this could have the potential of being a very defining moment in Kara's like early life that we could use later to say, hey, that is a really good standalone Supergirl story that but does fit into continuity and does inform part of how we see the character later. And maybe I'm being optimistic there, but there's nothing in this issue that makes me doubt that that 
can be the case. Like, I think this is a solidly told first issue with good art. Um, leaves us in a bit of a cliffhanger. I'm, I'm assuming you got really upset when Crypto got an arrow to the to the neck. Very upset. But, again, Red Sun, I'm sure he, it's not, you know... I'm sure he'll be fine, yeah. He'll, he'll be fine. I don't think he's, he's killing not, Crypto. then I'm going to burn shit down. <laughs> so. Tom, Tom King's not ready for the wrath of the internet if he kills Crypto. No, no. <laughs> This is not this is not Scott Snyder and horses. Right? Yes, like so. Yes, uh, but I did like the conversation between Kara and the girl at the end uh, quite a bit. Um, yeah. and you know, I, I I think there's also a nice examination of like, okay, so she says she lost her world when her father was killed, but she has mm-hmm. like you know like five brothers and a mum, but her mum's right. really dismissive of it, and I I, I like the idea of. The idea that one person, even though she's surrounded by other family members, like, she can feel like she's lost her world, even though she li- hasn't literally done that. Whereas Kara has literally lost her world. I think right. that's an interesting but comparison with, to make. So, the, what I read from that was, is, like, she's the only girl in a family of brothers, mm-hmm. right? And so, her dad treated her special. And that she was the one that stood out for her dad. Because of this. And so, that's why the loss of dad... The boys have just kind of accepted this is the world they live on, where she's like, well, why? They they killed dad. We have to go get vengeance. And I and think their 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 whole thing is like, oh well, that's just the world. And she's like, why does it have to be? Yeah, and, and so I think she's the one that's questioning. You know that fire. I think is also something that thematically ties to Supergirl. The idea that everyone else yeah. is too scared to act or thinks they shouldn't bother. Right. And she's the one who says, no, I'm going to, even though. I am a, a teenage girl who clearly can't take this guy in a fight. I'm going to somehow mm-hmm. find a way of doing this. You know, she has that energy. I think that does kind of tie to Supergirl. You know, aside from the you know the one, the, the the murderous revenge part. But I mean, you know, that's right. a character lesson to learn. And it is worth mentioning at the start of the book, she does refer to Supergirl as having the killing blow on the guy they're hunting. I'm sure there's going to be a swerve there. Yeah. Uh, or at least if it does happen, it's going to be extremely you know, built up and justified in, the, in a sort of big dramatic moment that'll right. have consequences. Well, is it this guy, as of right now, has zero redeeming qualities. Oh, yeah, he's a right. shit bag, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, and not to say that makes him worthy of Kara's wrath, but are we sure she's talking about Kara at that point? Mm. Um, that, that, that's my swerve, is... That could be a swerve, How yeah. do we know this is... How do we know that this is not... This girl becomes Superwoman, you know? Yeah, uh, in her own way. So yeah, it's worth mentioning the guy they're chasing actually gets into Kara's ship, which is on set to take off. So he actually takes off from the planet mm-hmm. at the end, as Kara and Crypto are both lying there with the like, arrows in them yep. <laughs> and bleeding and hurting. Uh, so but there's some nice little touches. I I kind of like the uh the whole moment where Supergirl sort of leaves her behind and she goes she goes in the little boat and we're left behind with the girl and she just sort of narrates and says, you know, if I hadn't, you know followed her that day this could have happened and that could have happened but i did follow her mm-hmm. and she jumps in so again it's that determination of like never giving up which is making her a little bit endearing uh as flawed as her I like, reasons may be yeah i like how she swims to keep, and keeps up with the boat mm-hmm. and it's just that whole like yeah i'm not gonna stop so you might as well help me I, I like that. It builds a character. I, I think that's mm-hmm. the thing. See if you take you forget that this is a Supergirl book you were looking forward to. It it, it does a decent mm-hmm. job of building the character and, and all. So yeah, yeah. I like the first issue. Is it is it as good as like any recent issues of Strange Adventures of or Rorschach? No, Mm-mm. uh, it isn't. But uh, I liked it quite a bit, and I liked it you know more than some other books, and mm-hmm. more than at least another book that i read this week so yeah um i i i am feeling i'm feeling optimistic and positive uh about it um so all right what are you, what are you uh what are you given uh, i'm gonna i'm gonna give this a 7.5 yeah i i think, I think i'll go a notch higher and give it the eight uh i, I would say i like the like the issue uh, i'm i'm looking mm-hmm. forward to seeing it develop and hoping yeah. it get, gets more into the the meat of the the character uh, drama. Yeah, seeing some of the more negative takes on it, it was a little bit uh, disheartening, just because it's like it's, it's issue one. Let's let's give it some breathing room before we start. Sure. Yeah, you know. But yeah, I just again just a tad disappointed. And then when I realized it was just 
two, the opening part of two great. I kind of got annoyed that I didn't figure it out <laughs> for myself. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. And because I think because Carrot is a very different person, that's where it's going to pivot and like going out. Like, mm-hmm. I'm sure there'll be similar beats in some ways. I mean, maybe this kid yeah. will lose an arm. I don't know. But, uh, yeah. spoilers for Trigger, I guess. <laughs> but, um, yeah. But yeah, I mean, yeah, I'm curious to see how the rest of it plays out. So, uh, that was Supergirl Woman of Tomorrow, issue one. The Flash 771, Jeremy Adams, writing with too many artists for me to write down. There was like four artists. Now, there's a reason. Oh boy. There's a reason now. There's, there's a reason in the, in the story. Uh, so, the issue is up until now when Wally's jumped into a speech still, that's been the whole issue. And it's been switching between an artist and the where he is, and then we're Barry and Mr. Terrific are in the lab trying to figure things out. And this one it starts to speed up and he like goes through three different like places and times. So there's a different artist with each one. So it, it is it's not like awkward the way it's in the, presented in the book. But there mm-hmm. there was a lot of artists. Um I will read them when I get to uh the credits page. But here I am. Uh, so Kevin McGuire, Howard Porter, Barrett, Pickmansky, Brian Hitch, Max Rayner, Scott Collins, Tom Derenick, Fernando Passarin, uh, O'Clair Albert, and Brandon Pearson. A lot of, a lot oh, of... Matt, Mike, 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 Yeah, stick it to you. Uh, a lot of artists I, I like and are familiar with. Yes. O'Clair Albert, especially. Uh, someone that uh, he came through uh, on uh, Hawkman, and that hmm. was a lot of fun. That, so, that's one I, I didn't know actually, but yeah, yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, I mean, I know most of the rest of them. Uh, mm-hmm. So this is picking up with Wally in Reverse Flash's body in a very like old school looking Legion of Doom. Although, as they discover in the lab, that it's not their past though. This is like a different universe. This is you know okay. somewhere in the Omniverse. A uh, different version. A much more cartoony Legion of Doom. Uh, and there's some bickering here, which is kind of funny, where Lex is trying to argue that he shouldn't... Because it, it looks like he's just killed Superman. Uh, like, Reverse Flash has just killed Superman right before Wally's beamed into his body. Mm-hmm. And Lex is, like, jealous and sort of saying, we, we shouldn't let him in here. He didn't even say he could do a lightning bolt thing like that. So, you know, <laughs> can we even trust them? Uh, Superman's actually not dead, though. He does get back up in a minute, uh, as you'd expect. But... Um, Wally tries to explain to him that he's not really a reverse Flash right now, and that Superman's the thing that's going to explode. Because, uh, you know, what, the energy keeps getting to different people every time he jumps to a new place. Uh, so I actually do think it was the right choice to start speeding this up and not do full stories in each thing. Um, because, you know, it could get a bit repetitive and feel samey. And I think this was the perfect issue, after a couple of fun issues of doing it, to move things along. So... You know, they solve this problem. He phases into a ship with uh, Lex. He goes out of space for a little minute. It's a kind of a you know, high-stakes sort of moment. Uh, and then he s- wisps away. There's a little bit of humor as well with uh, the guys back in the lab finally telling Linda that Wally's in a bit of a predicament. And we don't get to hear anything she says, but Mr. Terrific tells her on the phone, and he just looks like he's like like horrified uh, by the threats and the anger that he's hearing. Uh, but yeah, we, we we sort of jumped through like, a couple of quick sort of like he's in the old west uh, at one point. Um, and then he skips ahead to like a Titans Academy style thing where he's like a young Wally, and then he skips. He's like a Liberty Bell uh, and a GSA style thing, uh, and then he's like full on the Flash. You know, he you know, goes through a couple of these. So, so this is why there's a lot of ours because there's a few one pagers here in the middle where it's doing mm-hmm. very different things. Um, and Bar- Barry back in the, the lab basically figures out that the reason why it's not ended yet is because the Speed Force is trying is doing this over and over because it's trying to get rid of something else that's causing it damage. It's, like, it's basically trying to mm-hmm. uh, hack up uh, some bad food, <laughs> as, as, uh, as Oliver puts it. And it's like, okay, all right, so we have a bit more of a goal. But this is when things get interesting, right? So here's the thing. The end of this issue, understandably, is going to make a lot of people be a little upset, right? And we kind of knew it was coming because of the cover of the next issue. Mm -hmm. But the scene that leads us there is that Wally ends up in his son's body in the future. He ends up uh, in in Jay's body in about... I don't know if to give a... This is a little later, yes. He's he's an adult. He's about 25, 30, something like that. I don't know. Whatever. Right? And he's sitting there at a coffee table 
with Irie, who's also an adult. Mm-hmm. And Irie says, hey, Dad. Like, she knew he was coming, because as she points out, you've told us this story growing up, yeah. like, multiple times. Like, I knew, we knew uh-huh. you were arriving here today. And she says, look, it's all right. Don't worry. You're going to figure it out soon. Um, blah, blah, blah. But there's a lot of cool fun. Th- Obviously, he hugs her. He's like, oh my god, my, my daughter's like grown and beautiful and a woman and blah, blah, blah. And then he notices she's wearing a wedding ring and he's, he freaks out a little bit about it and he's like, oh, oops, I was meant to take that off. But yes, I'm married. You kind of hate him, but <laughs> I'm married. Uh, I'm not saying any more than that. And then he sort of looks down at his own hand and he's like, wait, is what, what about Jay? Is, is, is he married? And she says, oh, he would, he'll laugh when I tell him you asked that. Uh, but uh, he's dating a, a time traveler. I think you met her. <laughs> she's giving you an ulcer. So it's sounding like he's, she's talking about the uh, the booster like right. character uh, from earlier in the run, right. uh, which is a neat little joke. But it's this neat thing, um, you know, having this heart to heart. And she's talking about how you know she she he's taught her so much and that he's a great dad and all the rest of it. But then, obviously, this arc started with him saying he was retiring. He's not going to be a hero anymore. He's given it up. And we kind of all expected that at the end of the arc, it's going to be him learning or, you know, realizing that he's not going to make that choice. And when he says, like, oh, it's, I guess it's good that I retired and I could be there as a dad, she spits out her drink and just starts laughing. Because it's just the, the most ridiculous notion. It's like, mm-hmm. no, you didn't retire from anything. Like, you know, we learn from you to be a hero because you are the Flash and you were never going to stop doing that. And then she puts on her outfit. She's, you know, she's got her own superhero outfit. Um, mm-hmm. uh, we don't, we don't hear if, she, if she's got a, like a, a name specifically, uh, or if she just goes by the Flash. But it's a yellow, black, and red outfit with the uh, the long ginger hair coming at the top. It's, right. um, it's an okay design. She's got like a sort of jacket that's uh, reminiscent of like a. Are there all black canary? I guess on top of the. Yeah, the outfit. I'm, I'm trying to think if. Jesse Quick wore something similar. Hmm. For whatever reason, a or maybe excess did. Yeah, maybe. The, I mean, it's, it's clearly a combination of like other speedster colors and designs and uh-huh. and whatever. But he's like kind of shocked that she's a hero, and then he looks under his shirt and notices that uh, Jay's got a costume on too, and he's kind of you know he's weirded out a little bit, and says, "Look, no, you taught us how to be heroes. You taught us how to be good people. You're the Flash," and she she takes him into a. Uh, space basically to sort of run mm-hmm. into the like, uh, space of the speed force or whatever and shows like the sun with a lightning bolt going through it and it's just this, this big sort of like dramatic moment it's like see dad the flash family has done all right for themselves like you know uh because he says what is that and she says you'll find out so it, it looks like a planet or a sun with a lightning bolt going around it <laughs> like like it's a mm. flash planet which is a really weird idea but um, so that's teasing something for later in the run, perhaps, that is going to come into creation through the story that's probably coming. But she then says, look, you're about to leave. And he's upset by that because he wants to like keep catching up and like, you know, talking to his daughter. And she's like, no, don't worry. Like, you're go- like we got our whole lives ahead of us. I'm going to be raised by you. For- like, like, that's fine. Mm-hmm. I'll see you in the future. But this next part is going to be really hard. But don't worry, you're going to get through it and it's going to be okay. And then when he jumps again, the final page is him. He's, he's at Sanctuary. It's, you know, like, it's the moment. We're going, we're going to be dealing with him, dealing with what he did in Heroes in Crisis. Which, and before, and bef- yeah, before you make a noise, and before everyone freaks out, like, I don't like dealing with this either, but as much as I would like them just to sweep it under the rug and pretend it never happened, the point of this story was clearly always going to be how he gets over this so he can just be Wally West again. Obviously, this is what was going to happen. Matt, have you just turned on a washing machine? What's going on? No, no, nothing. Maybe the air kicked on. Maybe, yeah, I don't yeah. know. It got really loud because you've been quiet till. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It was real quiet. Um, so, look, I'm not thrilled about spending a story talking about Sanctuary or acknowledging its existence, but I think the intent of this arc and everything it's been doing for these past few issues, while they've not been like amazing, I think they're all solid enough in like progressing the character and having some fun comic beats and stuff. Like. I'm not worried. I'm not worried. Like, I, I don't expect I'm going to love a lot of what the next issue does. Maybe it'll surprise me. But, 
like the 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 scene that took place before he jumps to sanctuary was so good and so such a cool little tease of not only just because it's like oh the future is his kid but more specifically mm-hmm. because you know we spent a long time wanting the kids to come back but the idea that no they're not just back they're going to stick around they're going to have a future they're going to be heroes in the future they're going to be this they're right. going to be that and he's going to be the flash of course he's the flash so so my my uh, counter to that is there's no as of right now unless this is but why backdoor something that undoes heroes in crisis right like we know Williamson has Roy around from Infinite Frontier, so so that didn't stick. It doesn't seem like any of the booster stuff is sticking, or any of the Harley and Ivy. Well, I don't. Right? Why are you assuming they're going to backdoor uh, undo it? Because nothing. It hasn't had any lasting effect on anything. Sure, right? but I don't think the point of this is. I mean, maybe it will undo it. Maybe I'm wrong, but and that, that and that's why I'm but, wondering if this is. If this is the event that leads to Roy and you know what I mean? Oh, because... right. I mean, yeah, maybe they'll, they'll do that. But I think the important right. part here is less about the physical undoing of it and erasing it and more about just him dealing with the trauma of what he did and sort of like being able to forgive himself. I think that's that's more the point of this, I think, is the, is the character being able to move on past it. And as long as he actually does move on past it and we, we right. can forget about it after this arc, I'm okay with that, but some see some stuff. I'm okay with just sweeping under a rug. But I would have pre- I would have preferred that too. I I, I would have yeah. happily forgotten. Same same with you know Dick Grayson's like you know right Rick Grayson period. I would have happily just forgotten which, that existed. Well, which we'll get to, but I feel like there's a, an adept way of handling it, and Tom Taylor is handling it because it's Tom Taylor, right? Like yeah. This though, having not read any of it, it just it feels like. This writer went, oh, I'm going to fix it. And it's kind of like, eh. I've seen enough of the Flash TV show to know that when you try to fix things, sometimes you just make it worse. Don't bring that TV show into this. I don't... <laughs> and I just, you know, uh, and it's just as frustrating because of how bad Heroes in Crisis let me down. Speaking of Tom King letdowns and what it did to Wally and just for no reason, like... Uh, yeah, I, so like, this I think this is a noble enough effort. It's not necessarily a complete knockout of the park by any means, but I think it's a noble enough effort where the writer here, Jeremy Adams, clearly wants to not just ignore it, wants to find a way to have the character move on from it. And even if it's not that great in his execution when it happens, I'll at least appreciate the desire to do so. I appreciate the attempt. Um, mm-hmm. The the only caveat I have here, because I'm having a decent enough time with this arc. I you know I was kind of expecting to read issue one of this and or whatever the first issue and be was done. and be done. And I wasn't. Right. I saw enough potential and I've liked enough of the the last two or three issues quite a bit that I you know I'm sticking with it even though it's not perfect. Um, all I ask is that once we do this and once we have this story done of him getting over this, that we that's leave it. Heroes in Crisis behind and we don't talk yeah. about Sanctuary. And that's we're done. And and. And that's why I'm I'm wondering if it is a backdoor undoer, and that once Wally's done with it and timey wimey shenanigans, I mean, it, may, it, maybe it does. Roy's back yeah. and Ivy's in the predicament that she's in now, and and Harley is in you know where she's at. Because when you think about all of the stuff there, those are the the main characters that it really affected, right? We would always joke the only thing that seemed to stick from Heroes in Crisis was Roy's death. It's at the end of the day. He was still on the ground. Um, and Williamson seems to be undoing that in Infinite Frontier. So, yeah. I, I and I, yeah, and I, I, I trust I, Williamson if, enough. If I was to put he, a guess on it, I wouldn't say that any any of these things being undone is going to be due with this flashbook. It's going to be more, it's more to do with the fact that we had the end of Death Metal and we're doing yeah, Infinite Frontier. I think those Jeremy are the things that are Adams, affecting that. So I looked up Jeremy Adams and apparently he's a longtime Wally West fan. He's like us. He grew up so I am wondering if this is him just going like as a Wally West fan, the way that King dealt with the trauma isn't the way Wally would have dealt with it, and this is how I can do this, and that's hopeful. But personally, me, I just like to forget about it, and then when it gets brought up, I get grouchy. Which is, which is why it, I prefaced it because I said I right? know people, I know you were going to make yeah. a noise, and you're going to react yeah. when I said what the last page was, and yeah. I think. 
it was always going to go there at the end of this. It was always going right. to get to that point so it could do whatever oh. it's going to do with the character to try and get him past it. As long as it's not doing the future state by turning him into a homicidal maniac uh, horseman of the apocalypse, <laughs> no. I guess that's better than anything, right? No, it doesn't seem to be doing that, no. Uh, so, uh, yeah. So, yeah. I mean, the art, of course, is all over the place because it's like so many artists. Uh, I- I'm still not in love with the, the, the art in the lab uh, with, with Oliver mm-hmm. and Barry and all that, but... um. It's hard not to really like parts of this issue. It's hard not to, like, the first part's fun with the, with the Legion of Doom. Uh, him jumping through. I, I, I appreciated the pace of that because it started to feel like, oh, okay, right, they're, they're not going to waste time, like, telling the story of every single one, though, because it would get repetitive. Now right. it's just like, here's a montage of him going through various ones, some fun pages. And then we have this scene with, with Irie, which is sweet. It's... It's kind of a statement of intent in a lot of ways, which is what some of the dialogue in the first issue felt like as well. And again, the intent is something that I can completely get on board with. Like, I will take a, a consistent, like, 7 out of 10 Wally West book that feels like it's respecting the character and getting that part mm-hmm. right over, uh, I don't know, like a 9 out of 10 that's completely getting them wrong. And, I mean, not that that would make it a 9 out of 10 anyway, but you know what I mean, in terms of, like, other things, like no, quality. No, no, no. Yeah. I just... When it comes to this type of stuff, I, I'm worried that it becomes Wally's uh, killing joke, and we have to constantly redo it. And it's just like, okay, let's just let's just move on. Like it was an important part, but that's the whole thing. I don't feel like anything ever came out of it. So when we, you know, keep bringing it well, up, that's, that's just, the difference, though. Killing jokes yeah. actually, you know, liked and loved by right. many, and has been for decades. I don't think he was in crisis has no. a fan following that much. No, and then that's just the whole thing when it, you know, when it comes down to that, you know, it's like, well, seeing the Waynes murdered again, I just, I don't need it, but if you can do it in a way, you know, I don't know. I I think the key thing here is that it's not going, like, I think sometimes in comics there's this feeling of always going back to something, and I don't really feel like mm-hmm. this is going back to Heroes and Gr- even though it kind of is, right. but in the sense that I feel like it's it's just it's just we're still at the next part of the story. We're still just at him post that, so we're still dealing with right. it. As opposed to, right. it's not like we've done years of Wally West flash stories and oh now we're going back to Sanctuary to revisit a memory that's right. going to affect a new story that we've thought up. No no no, this is just a f- dealing with the aftermath because we've not really had a chance to do that outside of these like you know brief moments and uh like metal and death metal and whatever, mm-hmm. uh which did have some wrap up to it. Don't get me wrong, but I think this is yeah. like you know. This is the Wally West solo book that's going to address it, and hopefully, and the fact, I mean, I do like that it's framing it around the idea of him choosing ultimately to still be the Flash, and that right. should hopefully be uplifting, so if that can be pulled off halfway decent, then I'm going to come out of this feeling fairly positive yeah. about it. At the end of the day, I should just stop complaining that at least there's a Wally West book right now, despite me not reading it, so, you know, and it seems like the writer has... Uh, you know, really cares for Wally West as a character. Yeah. Uh, and plus, Jay Garrett got to punch Hitler in the face like a couple well, of I mean, issues ago. I'm, so. I'm always here for that. So, you know, uh, there's, you know, it's not gold by any means. It's not like the, the best crafted comic. It's a little bit messy in places uh, with how much is stuffed in. Uh, maybe a little bit overly wordy at times. So it's not something where I'm going to give it a high score. I'm still going to give this a seven. But. Mm-hmm. As seven as go, it's a seven that I'm enjoying reading each month, and there's definitely sparks of, like, at least care for the character, if nothing else. So, uh, you know, take that as you may, everyone, if you're wanting recommendations or not. So, Nightwing 81, Tom Taylor writing, Bruno Redondo on the art. Uh, Big, obviously, reveal at the end of the issue. Well, which we'll get to, but yeah. uh, to kick things off, we left the story uh, with Nightwing and Heartless standing in, surrounded by fire. Uh, although the start mm-hmm. of this issue actually starts with Melinda Zuko being sworn in as mayor of yeah. Bloodhaven. I, I love that, and then I just love the idea that that was just for, you know, the people, but the real city council wants to greet her. Yeah, all the- It's such a good vibe. I just... I, and I hate to do this because it cheapens Nightwing, but I really feel this is this is a Daredevil story, right? Like, I just feel like Blockbuster's Kingpin, and he just put his person in there 
and it's someone that you know Matt's familiar with, but it's also uniquely Nightwing that I just feel like these are just archetypes of street level characters at this point. Yeah, you know? like I, I dig the you know Kingpin leading all these mob bosses that are like you know how how are you going to serve my city mayor? Like yeah. there's kind of these. You mean Blockbuster? What did I say? He said Kingpin. Blop, that's your fault. Yeah, I wasn't yeah, thinking. I, know, but I wasn't thinking Kingpin. That's your fault. Just, you put that in my head. Seeing him, but so when you turn the page and you see him sitting there and he takes up a big chunk of the frame, all I could think of was Kingpin. You know, fair, Blockbuster's like, always taking up a fair chunk of the frames. Right, but still, like I just feel like this is just Nightwing's history that they're they are kind of similar down to the Escrima Sticks versus the Billy Club, and I just let Tom Taylor just do whatever he wants because it's still good. Mm-hmm. No matter what. Um, yeah, so yeah. we come back to Nightwing and Heartless. Barbara can't get a read on him because he's got uh, like coating on his outfit. Uh-huh. Um, and yeah, he, he lets the kids go because he's like, hey, you've got a, you must have an impressive heart, Nightwing. Mm-hmm. And he pulls out his heart extracting <laughs> device. Uh, but anyway, of course. Real on the nose. Yeah. Real uh, on the nose. N- Nightwing, of course, fights back, throws his stick, which he gets caught. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of nice art here is a two page layout with the, the punches and the flipping and there's all just this fire behind them so it's got quite a, a bit of atmosphere uh, continues on <laughs> uh, over the couple of pages uh, but then Heartless is like look you're you're taking all those kids out to that pier that's where Tim's taking them all and he's got that rig to explode the end of the pier and he does so he clicks it and it's fire and Great panel here, actually. I love the dog, uh, Haley. Um, yeah. You know, just Bitewing. Or, or now he's got an alias. He's now got two names, as pointed out yeah. later. Bitewing. Um, um, but he, he he's yeah. barking out. It becomes it becomes this real like sort of like try to get faith in the city again moment where Nightwing just says to Oracle, "Look, broadcast me over the over the ship frequency. Uh, let let me ask for help." And he just calls upon all the ships in the vicinity to come and help save the kids from the pier. And mm-hmm. we get this just great page of, like, all the ships calling in saying, hey, this is so-and-so, uh, we're on our way, you know, a couple minutes out. And there's that, you know, that, that wide panel in the middle of the page where just all the blinding lights of all the ships coming towards the pier. It's a very heartwarming thing. It's, you know, it's Nightwing having his faith in the city, rewarded. Um, mm-hmm. And that's kind of your, you know, that's your difference in some ways to a Batman story is, is these more that this is where nightwing obviously he is compared to daredevil a lot but this was a very spider-man yeah moment yeah i would say yeah that's what i mean these are just archetypes like spider-man sometimes street level but not all the time he's he can ride both both of those lines um but yeah it's definitely just archetypes of street level and it and it works right that's why it resonates so well like all these ships coming in to to take the kids you know uh, it's a really good superhero moment. Yeah, uh, but he passes out and does Nightwing. He wakes mm-hmm. up, he's got a concussion, Barbara's giving yep. him shit and saying that he should stay in bed. Uh, this is where we get the the new name of Bitewing, and he's like, the name's yep. Haley, and Barbara and Tim are like, uh, you're saying that we can't have more than one name? Uh, like, I've got yeah. three. <laughs> so yeah. that was great. Um, and this is the type of thing I was talking about before with like, we don't want to talk about Rick Grayson, right? We like to sweep that under the rug. However, Tom Taylor brings in the whole idea that Dick has to be careful getting his bell rung because he did survive a shooting to the head and in his job, he gets punched in the head a lot. That's not good for brains. No, I think it's a smart use of it in the sense that it's acknowledging there was head trauma, but it's not necessarily getting into specifics about what was happening. It's just, no, he was injured. That's all you have to really know. Right, but me and you know what that was, and so it's good that they're not just sweeping it under the rug. That he use it for a smart storytelling because it it's going to come into play later. They right? can, yeah, they can like, use it to make him feel vulnerable in situations mm-hmm. where you know maybe he's in a predicament. But this right. is where Barbara says, "So yeah, new mirror got uh, <laughs> got sworn in and shows him the Zuko name, and he's like, wait a minute, <laughs> I don't mm-hmm. like this at all.' And he wants to go and find out, you know." what she's up to, what her plans are, um, having a corrupt mayor that's working for all the mob bosses is going to make him trying to save the city much tougher. So he wants to go and like investigate. And Barbara grounds him and says, no, you're not going. You need rest. 
But Dick can't sleep, of course. Uh, nope. You know, he's up looking through. And the colours here are great, because you've got the, the blue interiors, but the, the red sky of the night time. Uh, yeah. Contrast there is wonderful. Uh, so, sure enough, he goes out, uh, gets up in the, the, the windows of this tall building. Uh, I enjoyed the... Uh, it's almost like you're reading an instruction manual, and you have the, the strip of instructions of how to do something in the middle, because the different art in that, that series of, like, four yep. panels where it shows you him, like, making the circle in the uh, in the glass in the window, uh, like a cat burglar. Mm-hmm. But Oracle gets out of the comms and gives him shit. And he's like, look, I'm not going to get into any physical activity. I'm just going to have a snoop around, okay? Just, just a wee I, snoop. I love this. He's like, you realize you're still wearing my camera. And he goes, y- yeah. Like, clearly he didn't. Like, yes. this is just another good Dick Grayson moment. Of, I didn't think this through all the way. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I do love him saying, so I'm not going to get into any physical activity. On the same yeah. panel, we see a henchman, like, waiting yep. with, a, with a sword. <laughs> like, and that's, yeah. Well, and I love that Barbara's there for him. And this is why I love this relationship, where it's not overtly romantic, but they're such a good team, where she's watching the cameras, right? And she's like, you got someone on your left. And it's just... You know, they just make a good team, regardless of there's romance there or not. But I, I do feel like it's an under, like he, that Taylor's being more nuanced about it, mm. right? But she's clearly a main character in this book with him. Yeah, I mean, he clearly understands why the relationship works, why we care about them being together, romantic or otherwise. And I, I, I just want to talk about this page. So that's page where he's fighting the the woman with the sword, uh, and yep. he's looking down the stairs. They are here. The layout is wonderful. The way it has the stairs go down from the top you know, row of panels. Um, mm-hmm. If I even just the way it does an extra outline of the, the middle box where he's like diving past their legs is just such a little touch that makes it, gives it that beat in the moment and the action. But the way the stairs go down and then when they go back across for the middle row of panels, the idea that the side of the steps that's facing us actually becomes the negative white space instead of just more stair color actually makes it feel more dynamic. And then mm-hmm. when the stairs go down to the you know the, the bottom row because we're looking through him falling back downstairs going the other way instead of getting full stairs we only get the sort of the top slates of the stairs right so we can see him falling through the stairs so it does this thing where every time we get another level of stairs they're presented in a different way and right. it makes it feel like the, the fight is ever evolving on the way down through the art uh and it ends with him getting hit with a bat because uh, Melinda Zuko comes out with a baseball bat. He's not, yep. he's, he's not in his best place. He's not ready to fight here. He wakes up. It's a red room. His mask is off. He kind of freaks out and says, wait, I'm not wearing my mask. I'm not wearing my mask. Uh, well, he doesn't even say it. He just thinks in his head, sorry. Uh, and Melinda looks and says, Dick Grayson. So she knows who he is now. Uh, mm-hmm. This is clearly a surprise for her in the moment. He breaks out of the restraints. He grabs and says, you're the daughter of Tony Zuko. And she says, I'm not. Uh, I thought I was for a long time, but my father was John Grayson. Cliffhanger, I'm your sister. Shocked. Mm-hmm. Shocked dick. You, you guys said quivering dick, too. Shocked dick. Yeah. <laughs> um, he's he's, he's I, a, a wreck with surprise. Yes. There you go. I, I, I don't buy this. I know the way that Redondo is drawing her right here. Is, is to mimic him and very, to be like, oh. Very, very but, similar hair, very similar yeah. sort of stature, yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 and you're just like, I don't, like, I don't buy it, but if she does, what does it matter, right? Like, if she thinks that she's John Grayson's daughter, but was raised, so what, what we find out here, too, is that Tony Zuko didn't stick around, right? She just has Zuko's name. It was Sal Maroney and the Maroney crime, crime family that raised her. Um, so she already has an identity crisis going on. Um, yeah. So I don't know if, if this is true and part of the reason why Zuko took out the Graysons was revenge on John. Uh, I don't know. Well, I don't like that part. I, I, I don't like the motivation for, a like, a, an origin story defining moment changing. In the same way that I don't like changing why Krypton exploded, right. or the same the reason why I don't like Batman's parents' murder being not random. Like, like I don't right. like those things changing. Um, 
I'm not against the idea. I mean, it's a little bit coincidental, don't get me wrong, yeah. that the person behind their murder, like, had a kid who was actually, <laughs> like, you know, Dick's mm-hmm. sister. Like, that, that, that is a bit convoluted, potentially, depending on how they go through with it. Um, what makes what I'm more interested in here, though, is the dynamics that are going to play out now that we've had this reveal, in the sense that is she playing the villains because she wants to like take them down from within? Is she actually just a villain? Is that something Dick's going to struggle to come to terms with? Mm-hmm. Those character dynamics are actually very interesting. Um, how they actually justify the sister twist, uh, whether yeah. it's real or not, is is going to be an interesting. Uh, uh, you know, it'll be very curious to see how taylor plays this and if it will ever ring tr- false because mm-hmm. well you might well, be doubting that it's true it's not it's not that you're doubting the writing you're doubting that the character's being honest or that or, right. even, or that indeed that she believes it but she's wrong perhaps exactly but like is there a point going to come where when the truth is revealed that we go oh we don't buy this because it feels forced and that's something that i would expect from a lot of stories like this but mm-hmm. and taylor i somewhat trust <laughs> So we'll yeah, see. no, uh, we've seen something like this before, kind of in All New Wolverine, right? When we get introduced to Laura's sisters, and okay, it was this sure. whole yeah. side that we never saw, and ultimately it didn't change who Laura was as a character. You know, she's still a Wolverine X twenty three, but we got Gabby, right? Um, and, and that introduction, and it works so well. With a slight little tweak to Laura's origin, I think. Um, and and here, if we get a long term character that she kind of is, she plays her side. Sometimes she's an ally to Dick, but she doesn't mind that he's Nightwing, right? It's just like stay out of my business, I'll stay out of yours. And they have this thing back and forth. It honestly is it's impossible to even predict what the relationship's going yeah. to be because we don't know we don't know enough about what her intentions are truthfully right now. Uh, right. to, to really make that guess. I will say the difference between this and uh, All New Wolverine is that those, those sisters, well, they technically existed. There were new clones. There were new characters. There were new additions. Whereas this is a character, well, technically new to us, is supposed to have existed since, you know, Grayson's childhood. So it's a little bit different. Right, but he doesn't really know her. Like, she's familiar with, with Dick Grayson, but it's not like... Well, that's my point, you know, though. This, that, is like that, 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 this is this is a retcon addition as opposed to an, a new addition. It, is she, though? Because this, to me, she feels like a new character that Taylor brought in. No no different than the sisters. No, but it's been you retconned know? into Nightwing's past, so therefore it's, it's, it's different. This is, this is adding a character into his past. Who, I mean, he didn't know about her, but that doesn't change the fact that this was supposed to have happened with his father, assuming this is true, which, you know, it might turn out not to be. Right. But right, right, right. that's very different than just creating new characters who are, you know, were literally grown in a lab in that case. Right. Uh, right. So they're just new. Uh, and a relationship forms from there. Now, the relationship that Nick forms with this character now from here could be very genuine, could be very war- heartwarming, could be something we end up really loving and all that. But there is a fundamental difference in that this is a character who's supposed to have existed previously in the universe back to a certain time. Uh but on no one who is this is a soap opera. This is the you've got a long lost sister. Ha ha. Uh, that's what this is, effectively. I mean, right. it may be right. told much better than that, but that's part- effectively what it is. Yeah, part of me hopes that it's true just be- for adding a new character. You know, that, I, I, that, I'm all for more supporting characters that have yeah. weight behind them. Uh, maybe there's some interesting dynamics here. I do kind of like that this issue shifted from the Heartless stuff to the Zuko, like Melinda Zuko mm-hmm. stuff. Because effortlessly, it, it feels to me now like Heartless is kind of lingering in the background now, right? Where mm-hmm. he can maybe like be gone for like a full issue. Maybe he'll pop up at the end of the next issue, or maybe it'll, they'll, they'll give him a full issue off. But it feels like he can strike now, and it's going to feel like it's not a cheat because no, no, we got distracted with the Zuko stuff, and it makes sense that mm-hmm. that Dick would get distracted not only just because it's it's important to the say because that name Zuko has a lot of weight to Dick. Like he would drop what he's doing to go find right. out was a Zuko doing what now, and he go. Check that out. Right. Right. There's a personal and attachment yeah, this to is, it. This is four issues into Taylor's run, and Zuko's been mentioned in every single one. So it, it, he's just swapping the plots from foreground to background. Yeah, um, effortlessly. But I like, yeah. I like the mystery with Heartless, though, too, is that 
you know, I remember, and this this is gonna go back. I remember I got into Hulk comics. And I wanted to know who Red Hulk was, right? And the way that Marvel was selling it was this whole mystery of who was Red Hulk. And by the end of the first arc, you didn't know, and it kind of took the wind out of it, right? Mm-hmm. Here, where you have Heartless, I don't need to know who Heartless is, but I feel like less is more at this point because it keeps that mystery I and just the, the creepiness, you know what I mean? Like Right now, I don't feel like they're selling it like he's someone we're going to know. Oh, I don't mean it. I don't yeah. mean like that. I'm just yeah. talking about like, you know, when you see this cover and Heartless is so front and center that you would think like, oh, we're going to get a resolution to this Heartless thing. And it's like, well, no, we're, we're pushing that back and we're going to keep Heartless. You know, if, if we keep this going for a long time, I think it's fine because Taylor's earned that trust that the, the balance here, because I like how creepy Heartless is. Like, we don't get villains like that too much <clears throat> anymore. When he said like, oh, no, the kids can run. I like when they run. Wait, what? Uh, and then you find out that, that the whole part was to to drop the fear to the pier and then mm. blow up the pier. Like, it's just, man, you, you you put a face to that or you make him more of a traditional villain and I feel like it loses. And he has a lot of like, sick dialogue there where he talks about how yeah. he likes to watch people like die and suffer, but yeah. you'll imagine this one. I I actually right. uh, almost felt like a, like a Dark Knight Rises like, uh, paraphrasing. You know when Bane yeah. says, "I'll have you'll have to imagine the fire." He says, "I'll have to imagine the uh, or I've got a good imagination." It just it made me think of that a little bit. Mm-hmm. Uh, I will say I, I do expect there'll be some resolution to the heartless stuff by about issue six, just because that's where you know arcs typically right. wrap right. up. I don't know if it'll be the end of the story overall though, but I, I could see it having some sort of climactic, you know, right. chapter end there at the very and, least. You know, we've we've read enough Taylor to know that he's great at weaving stuff in. It's kind of early Johns was the same way. Where if he knew he was gonna have enough issues that you would he he would pay stuff off later. So again, I go back to all new Wolverine, and some of the stuff that that Taylor plotted in the first comes back and pays around by the third trade or so. Yeah, you know. So and that that's the type of comic storytelling I'm a fan of. You know, it it pays off like like it's a full on tapestry of a story, versus these are just little arcs that happen one after another. So. But yeah, yeah no, this was... is really good. Like, I'm so glad. Like, I get I get Tom Taylor writing a good Nightwing book, and now he'll be on Superman. And those are two things that we've been asking for, and DC has now made happen. Yeah, so... I mean, I hope this is a long run, obviously. There's, there's mm-hmm. no, like, quibbles or doubting that. But I, I, it, it does feel like it's, it's setting up some stuff that we can play with for a long time. Uh, and, you know, these other supporting characters that are becoming more prominent... Uh, mm-hmm. set- I mean, just the fact that he's setting up the landscape of the, the politics of the city at the same time of having like a villain that Nightwing's having to deal with, and even just giving Nightwing all this money to set up, it feels like it's setting up a lot of things that it's going to take a run to work through and like do all these stories and and tell all the tales that need to be told. So, mm-hmm. uh, it's not a good issue. Uh, the actual sister reveal, uh, like I say, it's a bit soap opera uh, on on mm-hmm. its own on, on the surface level, but. Uh, I do think there's a lot of potential for the dynamic between them. Uh, whether or not it's true, whether or not... I mean, I expect he may have some time trying to figure it out if it is true or not. He may get Babs mm-hmm. on the case to to try and figure it out. I mean, Babs may already, yeah. al- already be looking at it. She's probably seen in the camera. Uh, right. Right. Uh, if, if they didn't get conked out when he got hit with the bat. But... Uh, interesting. So, uh, what are you giving Nightwing issue 81? I'm giving this a... Nine. I will give it a. Hmm. Eight point five. Okay. Eight point. Yeah, eight point five. Okay, eight point five. All right. Yeah. Uh, so, Catwoman issue thirty-two. Ram V writing with Evan Cage on the R. So we have a different R for this issue. It is kind of a interlude issue in a way. Uh, we have Father Valley questioning uh, one of Catwoman's associates, yeah. and um, it kind of dovetails into other characters talking about Selena. So Selena, Selena herself isn't really. I mean, she's in the the stories that are being told about her, but she's not really in mm-hmm. this issue directly herself. 
and it's all kind of the the legend of selena as told through others and what she's like so the, the main story we keep coming back to this this like sort of uh Thetis heist job in sicily i think it was yeah um right we keep coming back to that and it's this guy talking about how it's the first time he met her and how she was kind of this and this was before she was really full on Catwoman yet uh so she had this fiery yeah, spirit she's just selena from alleytown basically and mm. she's hanging around with the the kind of the um the guy that runs it what, what's that in like a group like the, the point man i guess mm. like this was reminding me a lot of a a brubaker criminal issue mm. right like you just switch the names out and this feels like one of those early criminal issues um but like the the leader of this little gang brings her in and everyone's kind of like oh who's this young chick and why does she seem to have so much pull over this dude and then they they do the heist and things go bad um and you know selena ends up to basically i don't want to say it's the birth of catwoman but she starts to show some of her more catwoman-y stuff here where she sneaks in and, and basically gets revenge yeah for it that doesn't kill the guy just like no. Ties him up, strips him down, and leaves him next mm-hmm. to an empty safe. Uh, as, as, right. the, as the story goes, and we have other stories, you know, just or not even stories per se, but like the kids are all lined up because it, you know they mentioned last issue that me on the canal was going to put the, you know, mm-hmm. tighten the screws on Alley Town because of uh, Selena's you know interference and in some of the going ons that she's not maybe you know putting her nose in, mm-hmm. and the corrupt cop who was in the previous issues, like sort of like you know basically mocking the kid ah you thought you lost me that you know during that chase a couple issues ago but i'm back now and this becomes the the kids having a bit of spirit and like you know talking back but and them saying oh we're going to get her we're going to get selena the cat woman and the kids just kind of laugh and say you're not going to get her here you don't have any clue what you know this place is like and this leads to you know a story of the past uh where selena was a kid and the the criminals uh, for always, what's the name of the uh, the woman she worked? Mama Fortuna. There we go. Mama uh, Fortuna. Yep. Yeah. Uh, where basically they were going to use the the, the maze like tunnel system under under Gotham to like get their stolen goods around, and the cops like showed up and like got some of them, but Selena they didn't get so they didn't get the map. The map was sort of lost in the in the fight, and Selena's yeah. down there with a bunch of the guys. They don't know their way around. They're getting lost. They're thinking they're never going to get out. And Selena's like, no, I can get us, I can get us to the the drop off. We can go, and she does. And it turns out when she talks to Mama Fortuna, she actually memorized the map as soon as she, you know, she she made a point of memorizing it as soon as she got her hands on it. And she even did a dry run. She went down into the tunnels and made herself familiar with them before it ever mm-hmm. started. And it's kind of showed her ingenuity, her planning. Yeah, you know, we talk about Batman's planning a lot, but this was showing that Selena kind of has it's a lot of that. The, <laughs> to borrow a, an internet phrase, I'm not a big fan of, but it's why they're the one true pair, right? <laughs> like, they do balance off of each other, is that they're perfect, they're the same, they're different sides of the same coin, you know? Where sometimes Batman gives into his worse instincts, where Selena has to give into her better instincts, and that's where they meet in the middle. Um, so, uh, they're your one true pair. Is that, does that mean you're also shipping them? Are you shipping, uh... No, no, I thought you were going to make another joke, uh, there, but I'm glad you didn't. Oh, oh, you thought I was going south. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> like Batman doesn't. Uh... Because he's a hero. Allegedly. Allegedly. <laughs> I'm just, that's what the people <laughs> said. I'm, I'm just, you know. Yeah. Uh, you know, you know Dick's a hero. That's all I gotta say. Um. So yeah, so so the kids are telling the story to the cops, and it's you know it, it's this kind of you know de- defiant little moment, and I, I like the art on this page because the, the 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 bright lights, the 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 flashlights, and the, the the headlights, the cars are just washing them out, so they're just completely covered in light. But it doesn't matter; they're still kind of defiant and still sort of saying that you're not gonna get Selena, you have a chance, mm-hmm. and it sort of keeps coming back to the Sicily story throughout. Uh. And Father Valet said to this guy, "Like, we'll let you go. Like, I'll, I'll let you go when you're done telling me what, what, what I want to know. I, I have no uh, quarrel with you, effectively." Uh, and then, you know, the other cop who we've been following throughout this run, uh, he goes to speak to Selena's sister and asks her questions. And just like before, we, we sort of dovetail into a 
a story into a story that she t- tells her about how when Selena as Catwoman took her place when Black Mask was torturing her. Which, by the way, I think the art in this issue is actually quite good. But I will say mm-hmm. that is my most hated Black Mask mask I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> yeah, it's bad. Here's the thing. It's not that this art's bad, it's just not Fernando Blanco. No, I, I actually think the art is mostly really solid. But the art is really... If we had not been spoiled by Fernando Blanco over the b- bunch of issues, this would be, like, fantastic. Maybe, you know, art of the week contender in parts. Mm. Then you see Black Mask and you're kind of like, uh, okay, maybe not. Um... Yeah, I, I didn't even realize it wasn't Fernando Blanco really until the first couple pages in, just because I come to expect it, and I was like, "Oh, this is different." I think he does a so, good job. The, the artist here does yeah. a good job of the because the first few pages of Father Valley, like in, you know, torturing the guy, like that that's, yeah. that stuff actually didn't feel that different. It wasn't until it started going into the flashbacks and the other stuff where it was starting to vary styles a little bit more. Uh, but this is a story of how Selena sort of took her place, and after she was being tortured, and then. But obviously had a way to get out of the chains and sort of fought mm-hmm. back and, uh, you know, ended this and watched Black Mask fall, uh, as, as he's sort of hanging off the the edge of the window with the, in the pouring rain, mm-hmm. uh, kind of thing. So that, that, watches but, each one of his fingers go. Yeah, you the, know. Again, the idea being that she always has a plan. She had a plan to mm-hmm. like get out of the chains and save her sister, uh, and she even has like a. This is actually a very Spider-Man pose. There's like there's a panel of her like in in the city night, jumping through mm-hmm. the rain. Yeah, it's a very Spider-Man pose. You can almost like draw in the webbing mm-hmm. if you wanted to. <laughs> but it's a good, it's a good panel. Well, it's like when he falls to to you know, so he can get elevation. Yeah. You know, physics. Yeah, I mean, because it, it makes this point here that the it, your sister says the only thing Selena doesn't plan for is how what she does affects the people she cares about. Um, right. so there's always going to be collateral and we're kind of seeing that in this story like we're seeing multiple yeah. people she's been with get interrogated, the kids are being arrested and abused by the cops like we're seeing mm-hmm. the people she cares about be affected by her actions but ultimately she's going to win she's going to beat whoever's doing it because she always does um, right. it's, she's comfortable with what the losses are even if maybe she's not like deep down yeah. So she has her plan, but in the short term, it's going to mess her up because we all know, we all know how the stuff with her sister affected her, right? Yeah, and the, and the, so, the cop asking this, I forget his name. Is it like Nathan mm-hmm. or something like that? I don't remember. I don't this is one of the things I never remember his name, but I, they always say it in the book, so I always just read it out yeah. of the book every time I need to remember it. But I didn't come up with this issue. But they've had he's had kind of like a you know a, a weird sort of friendly rivalry with mm-hmm. Catwoman. That's why he kind of followed her here, and she even you know then he's, her sister says to him. Look, it's Adley. Adley, there you go. Uh, yeah. You might want to, like, you know, get away from her, you know, for your own sake. The idea being that he's someone that you know is close enough to her now that someone might go after him to get to her. Uh, not that he's right. the closest by any means, but you know, clearly everyone around her is starting to like feel the wrath of like everyone coming right. after her. So, yeah. So, and then it finishes the Sicily story, uh, and the book ends with Father Valley saying, "I told you I'd set you free." Which to him meant stabbing the poor bastard and yep. leaving him for dead. To, to go. And yeah. that's the end of the issue. So, really good interlude issue that kind of did a lot to like sort of build mm-hmm. up Selena, even without any advancement. But it's also set, you know, heightened the stakes because everyone's like, all this is happening around her now. All these people are getting affected around her. So, this was, this was a good, this was a good issue for building the, uh, the heightening the drama of the story. It feels like things are like really starting to kick off right and, and almost almost building the legend of selena mm-hmm. as as we're getting you know the, the queen of alley town um but yeah i also like that there's a lot of parallels that that ram v is drawing between cheshire well shoes at this point mm-hmm. cheshire cat and selena just you know there's there's a an image of as as they're telling the story of young selena the same pose on selena as there is for shoes mm-hmm. and it's like you know i so i like that you know dc and legacy go really well together so yeah M- much like taylor's night when there's a lot of like smart storytelling here where clearly there's a plan in place for uh, mm-hmm. uh you know an overall story that's, that's, that's that it's going through uh, and again hopefully this this runs along uh, assuming ram v's got got the uh story but e- even if this ends up being like a, a 12 issue run yeah 
uh, with a, a beginning, middle, and end, this will be a fantastic like hardcover or something to recommend to people. Because mm-hmm. uh, it's very, very, very good. Uh, so, yeah, that's did a, that's did a lot to sort of heighten the the current drama stakes of the, the, of the story. Um, right. With everyone closing in on Selena and how that's affecting everyone around her. So, I, now, so now I'm anticipating, now I can't wait for the next issue to see how Selena fights back. How does she claw back? What is her plan? What is her, you know, what is her way to land on her feet, to use a cat metaphor? There so. you go. And how many lives has she gone through? Ah, oh, right? 52. <laughs> there you go. That's my guess. 52. So, and they are, well, obviously it's a different artist, and it's, you know, d- does falter a little bit in places. Uh, Black Mask's mask being one of the, the standouts. Yeah. Um, it's generally still pretty good, and does a good job of emulating the style that we've been kind of ha- mm-hmm. having in the book. So, uh, what are you giving uh, Catwoman 32? I'm giving this, I'm giving this an 8. Yeah, I'm, a, I'm also happy to give it the uh, 8 out of 10. So, mm-hmm. uh, good stuff. So, uh, final book that uh, we're going to talk about today is a Patreon book. So, every month at patreon.com slash uh one of the higher tiers, you can make myself a corner read a book, and one of our patrons is making me read through The Joker, uh, the current series. Uh, so, because, obviously, it started a month, or because the, the me reading this for Patreon started a month later than the, the issue came out, I'm a month behind. So, issue four came out last week, I'm reading issue three today. Uh, but it's still fairly relevant, it's not that far behind. And uh, I'm glad I'm reading it because there's a lot of interesting stuff going on here for bat related stuff, uh, particularly Gordon and Barbara, and uh, some interesting beats here. So, um, yeah, so this is obviously James Tyne in the fourth. Gillen March, unfortunately, on the art, uh, which is the biggest detriment the, the book has. Uh, the book starts with kind of a, a you know Gordon thinking about a uh, killing joke you know at the, at the fairground mm-hmm. and sort of what Joker you know tried to make him go mad that day and how he wonders that sometimes like he you know Joker didn't succeed but sometimes he's worried that maybe maybe he did in some small ways that he, he can't quite comprehend um and he talks about how he used to get mad at Batman for focusing on the costume villains when the real threats were the, the more corruption and things like that but over time, of course, he saw that, yeah, we all took Joker far too lately when he first appeared. We all took him as this guy who was seeking attention, and clearly he's much more dangerous than that. But, so, Gordon is getting on the private plane to go and hunt Joker. Uh, this, uh, you know, Cressida, or whatever her name is, uh, she's seen him off, which, and you weren't here for the last issue of this, Matt, when I, uh, no. with the, with the, the ending revealed she was doing this to get to get basically accepted into the Court of Owls. So there's a lot of stuff going on here. Oh uh, <laughs> a lot of stuff going on here. Uh, tying to a lot of things. Um, but he's given basically a, a limitless credit card to do what he wants with while he's on this mission. Uh, and she even encourages him to enjoy it a little bit. You know, get an ice room. You know, get an ice meal <laughs> when you land. Mm-hmm. Kind of thing. So he goes in. The big masked like henchman is on the flight with him. Uh, who may or may not be Bane, <laughs> but that's maybe a bit too yeah. obvious. Um, but what's interesting is we cut back to so he texts Barbara to say, you know, yeah, like you know, I'm on the plane, and Barbara's like, yes, yeah, I'm, you know, I'm monitoring, and this is where we get really interesting because she turns to Steph. Steph's in the room with her, and Steph complains a little bit, it's like, hey, why am I doing the boring work? She's like, here, yeah, you're going to help me deal with this data. Uh, and she's like, yeah, but that's not as cool as what Cass is doing. And Cass is actually in pursuit. She's actually on the car that Cressida's is in because they're going to find out who she is and where she's from and what's going on with her. So she's actually got the Batgirls doing like, you know, recon and other work that's going to tie into like, you know, finding out what's going on here with these characters. So again, it really feels like it's part of Gotham right now and part of the, the Gotham world. Mm-hmm. So... That stuff's really neat. I really like that inclusion. Uh, obviously, I'm always going to. But I, I love that, much like Babs, Cass and Steph are a consistent part of the world that are being called upon to help with things. Uh, it's very neat. So we get a reminder that there's some other characters coming for Joker. Uh, the, the family, uh, the, the Texas Chainsaw style family, the, uh, the, the supporters of Bane from Santa Prisca who are coming on mm-hmm. a ship. Like, you know, there's people coming after Joker who aren't just Gordon, so there's this kind of momentum building to this, like, crescendo. And 
Yeah, you know, the middle of this issue is actually really cool. It's, it's, it's Gordon basically trying to, like, talk casually with locals in Belize to find out where Joker might be, because, you know, they speculate that there's a safe house somewhere here, which is correct. And he's basically just, and it's almost, do you know what this, this is almost? It's good detective work from Gordon and him with his people skills, like, try to talk to them to find out if there's stories of stuff happening somewhere. And he's basically like, yeah, no one's ever going to go after the people who have set up these safe houses because they're too powerful. But the people who work in the area, the people who have to go there and clean the houses or have to go there and do the plumbing or whatever, they'll hear things, they'll see things, and they will talk. Mm-hmm. And it kind of, the, the way they kind of like go whole hush when they start talking about a certain house, it's kind of like almost uh, like a horror movie where it's the one it's, house they don't talk about because, oh, if you go there, you're going to die. <laughs> kind of thing. It's the old Myers house. The old Myers house. Or it's Crazy Ralph. Yeah. It's got a uh-huh. death curse! You know, it's it's <laughs> that. So I was kind of digging the vibe of this, actually, because it was very much that horror movie kind of vibe. Um, but it's done through the, the guise of this police detective sort of investigation angle. And Gordon's good at his job. So he hears enough creepy things about this one area that everyone's scared to go to that he gets the hunch that he's going to go there. And it kind of subverts your expectations because as soon as he goes to the door, Joker just opens and says, Jimbo, is that you? Uh, Oof. Why are you making it? Joker's here. Of course, it's, it's called the Joker, Matt. <laughs> no, no, no. That sight, though, is terrifying. The Joker being excited to see you? Oh, sure, yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's what I was making it for. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, so what's interesting about this is that it, it's kind of doing something very interesting with the premise here because, you know, Gordon pulls his gun and Joker uh, kind of smiles and then all of a sudden there's a lot of red laser sights on Gordon's forehead. There's like a team of shooters behind Joker who I don't actually think they're working for Joker. I think this is people who are here for Joker. Uh, or or, or maybe, maybe they are working for Joker and that's because he's expecting people. But he's like, hey, Garden, we're still friends, right? You know that whole thing in Arkham a month ago, someone gassed it? He's like, yeah, you, you killed a lot of people. He's like, no, 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 no. That, as crazy as this sounds, that wasn't me. But someone wants everyone to think it's me. And we know it wasn't him. We, we know it was uh, Scarecrow right. related. Um, and then after this, you, you get shots of, like, you know, some of the, the Santa Prisca Bane looking, you know, costume people in the jungle coming like they're like a team from Predator. And then you get the people, the, the crazy family on the on the bus, uh, who they've like basically stolen a bus and killed everyone on board, and they're coming in to like get Joker. So there's this crescendo in coming, and then the cliffhanger of the book is you know, uh, Joker grabs a couple of machine guns and says, "Keep that go- that gun drawn, Jimbo. You're going to need it." And it says, "Next war buddies." So do you know what it's doing? It's putting Gordon and Joker in an almost assault and precinct thirteen style scenario yeah. where all these people are coming to hunt Joker. And Gordon's being a good person isn't just going to let them, let them kill Joker, and no, and they're probably going to try and kill him too because he's just there. And well, so and it, and it feels to me like Tynan's whole mission statement on this was, it, it's that Gordon defies Joker at every time. So that whole mm. everyone's just one bad day away yes. of, from becoming Joker, which which he mentions no. uh, at the right. start. He actually quotes that line when Gordon's thinking right. about it. Yeah, right. So. Tiny's going, not Jim Gordon. He was never close. And this is why, because someone's coming to kill Joker. He could just let him. He won't. No. He's Jim Gordon. Even though it's hanging oh. over his head that he's here to kill Joker. Even though that's in right. his mind the whole time. Um, right. So, furthermore, I will reiterate this again. This is a Jim Gordon book. It's not really yep. a Joker book. Joker's a prominent character in it, sure, but it's a Jim Gordon book. And th- the way this is built by dealing with Gordon's own trauma. And then issue two being Barbara, like him, like him revealing that he's known that she's been Oracle and Batgirl this whole time, and yeah. that the, the 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 progression that comes from that, and then this ending with a tease of an assault in precinct thirteen thing where he's going to have to have an uneasy alliance with a Joker just to survive, like mm-hmm. all of this is great. The worst thing about it's the art, because it's Gillen March, yeah, and some right. of it's not as bad as it can be. Some of it's just as bad as you think it's going to be, but. The art's the worst thing about it. I'm actually really digging the story of this. <laughs> it's doing smart That's things. Yeah. The biggest problem with this book is that they called it The Joker, which is understandable because that'll sell more copies because it's called The Joker. But the biggest well, I... problem for people who groan at that is that it's not really a book that should be called The Joker. 
No, but then they do the whole bait and switch price thing too. Because had they not done that, the price. I might be checking it out, but now out of principle. Oh, I mean, that, that, yeah, but that's a problem that's separate. That's got nothing to do with the the rating. Yeah, but whatever. that's what I'm saying. Like, if if this was, you know, Streets of Gotham or whatever, with the semi with the subtitle of the Joker. Okay, and then you, but it being a dollar more. Uh, come on, DC. Yeah, you know. I mean that's obviously its own problem, and that's that's why I had originally stopped reading it until Patreon right. stepped in and made me read it, but. Um, right. That, that's a separate thing. Like, but in terms of this, what the story is actually doing, it's actually doing some really solid stuff for Gordon's character and progressing even his relationship with Barbara. And yeah, and yeah, Assault on Precinct 13 style like standoff with Joker and Gordon working together, like reluctantly. There's a lot of potential in that that I, I don't dislike. So, you know, uh, I'm game. Uh, so that's the main story. Uh, I would happily. It's weird rating because I don't like the art. Uh, so. <laughs> Here's what Connor does and then give it a straight five. Like, if it's a <laughs> decent art, it would make up, you know? I, that feels disingenuous, though, because I enjoyed it more than that. So mm. Give it a six, then. I might give it a seven. There you go. Give it a seven. Uh, with good art, it would, you know, it would be at least an eight, if not mm-hmm. like 8.5 or something like that. But, you know, I'll give it a seven. Uh, the backup story... Uh, Harper Row is with uh, Punchline's friend from college who seemed to be very much involved with all of her antics before she became Punchline. Uh, he seems to have changed and is scared of everything. He's shown Harper the, the storage closet or uh, locker that has all the uh, stuff that, sh- that she had before. Uh, where he, this is where he put it after the police just kind of left it behind. And he shows her the fact that they've got original like recordings of her, of like Joker's interviews from Arkham and stuff like that that they got, like, on the black market and all, all sorts of things. It basically just builds to a big reveal where he actually is still worshipping the Joker and he's trapped her there because there was, a uh, like, basically uh, paralyzing gas in, in something that he shows her. Uh, so Harper's left and he starts, like, pouring gasoline around. And he's like, hey, Punchline might have got to hang out with the Joker, but I'm actually going to murder someone first. And that's kind of the cliffhanger of this uh, backup story. Yikes. So that's going on. Meanwhile, the subplot here is that uh, the... Oh, I can't remember her name. The leader of the Royal Flush Gang in the prison. Uh, she is sending Orca to either kill or at least beat up Punchline. And Punchline fights back uh, mm-hmm. a little bit. But there's a two-page layout where there's a big fight. Uh, and then Orca sort of picks her up at the end, though, as if he's kind of, as if she's kind of regretting uh, doing this much damage to her. So that's just kind of all we get of that. Uh, so I mean, these are obviously very short, uh, and this is effectively I've just summed up everything that happens. Really, yeah, the cliffhanger is the big thing, though. Um, mm-hmm. I, I mean, I'm enjoying it well enough. I think it's one of those things where it's just a little bit too short to really get too invested in one particular chapter. I think. Once you can put all these backups together, they complement what's going on quite well. Because I, I think the story of Punchline and Harper and talking about people being indoctrinated into her bullshit, much like Harper's brother, you know, there's a lot of stuff there that I think complements what's going on with Tynan's Gotham in general. Um, there's not a lot to talk about in them on their own, though. It's kind of like talking about a digital issue. It's just, it just too short to have too much to say. But uh, it's perfectly fine, though. So, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll give this a a perfectly solid seven as well because you know the art's better for one and mm-hmm. uh, i would say the story's not as good as the main but of course the art's better so i'll I'll, I'll say it evens back out to a seven uh so there you go that's uh joker issue three so um so i'm you know i'm glad that the patron's making me read something that uh is actually it's not painful it's not painful yeah i'm I, i'm thankful yeah. that i'm being it's the anti-connor the anti-connor yes so there you go. That's uh, Joker issue three. Uh, so that'll take us out at the part of the show where we pick our favorite stuff of the week, favorite panel slash moment, favorite cover, favorite art, and uh, do our top. Well, four in this case because there's only four books. Uh, <laughs> three for me. Three for you. <laughs> so hey, hey, yeah. it is what it is. They, they couldn't put the hundred page book this week. Like really? No, not at all. Of what? course not. I, would, uh, I mean, I know we had or, or one of the books that's but... coming out next week. Uh, this week. Uh, yeah, that would have been good too. Yeah, there's, there's those options. But hey, uh, so panel slash moment, Matt, what are you uh, hitting us with? So I, I, I could go from either three of these. 
you know, there's a lot of good moments. I, I could go with Supergirl, you know, ha- being stuck with three arrows mm-hmm. and still fighting off people. But I'm going to go with from Nightwing, where he's coming into the window and the henchwoman is standing there waiting for him. Uh, it's just a great image. The way that that is composed, it looks great. And that it has, you know, him talking to Babs uh, and just really shows their, their teamwork at play. Fantastic. Yeah, um, I'm going to go with. I was going to cover it while you were doing yours, just so I had something. Yeah, you're fine. But, uh, I, I, yeah, I'm probably going to go with Nightwing. I, I mean, I'm, I'm tempted to go with the, the, the headlights on shoes and the, and the interrogation okay. stuff in Catwoman, but I am going to go with Nightwing, and I think I'm going to go mm-hmm. with the fight down the staircase. I think that page is is really impressive and has a really good flow to it. So that's my pick for the week. Uh, best cover of the week, Matt. Uh, what do you have? So there, there's a couple in here. Um, I really like the Nightwing variant done by Redondo. It's with him and 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 Tim on there. There's a couple. At least that's according to I, Comic Geeks. Yeah, I feel like every cover Nightwing had this week was good because I really like the yeah. the one where he's on the gargoyle is a beautiful yeah. sort of digital art painted too. one. Even even the Pride one looks really good. Well, like it's it's um he's doing the handstand. On top of the on top of the flagpole, yeah. No, it's good. Yeah, it's a good variant. That no, looks good too. Uh, but but the Catwoman Frisian cover with her in the purple suit mm. takes me back to '90s vibes. Uh, I'm gonna go with that one. Well, I'm gonna give a show to the Gary Frank Supergirl variant because, I knew, and I knew you would. That's why I left it all on. Yeah, because it's funny. I'm not gonna pick it. I'm I'm gonna go with one of the Nightwing variants. I'm gonna go with the one on top of the gargoyle. I I love that uh cover, but uh. I do want to give a shout out to the Gary Frank Supergirl because any Gary Frank covers that I get is uh, yes. fine by me. So, uh, shout out to that. Uh, all right, best art of the week, Matt. This is tough because I got Evely, I got Redondo. Mm-hmm. I got Evely, I got Redondo. And just because I enjoyed the book a little bit more, I got to give it to Redondo. Mm-hmm. Good night, Wayne. Yes, uh, I'm also going to give it to Redondo for Nightwing. Um, oh. I, I like Evely's art, but I definitely like Redondo in general more, I would say. Yeah. So for me, it wasn't that much of a tough choice. But Yeah, I, I don't feel like this Supergirl really played to Evely's strengths as much as something like One Woman Issue 8. Oh my god. What? <sighs> and I, I only said that so I could say that, because no, the art in Supergirl was great. The expressions were there. It's just, it was weird because it's a fantasy western vibe. So things are just a little bit off by design. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, but Redondo stuff is so clean. It almost has a pop art feel at some points. And it's just, it's everything that I want in Nightwing art. So it's kinetic. It's it's bright in places where it needs to be. The colors are all there. The art team's working in, in unison. Yeah. So. Uh, that's all. So, uh yeah, just drank the books then, I guess, Matt. Yeah, it, it, it's going to be Nightwing, Catwoman, Supergirl. But they're all stair step. It's close. Yeah. You know, one place show. Yeah, uh, for me, it's pretty similar. It's Nightwing, Catwoman, Supergirl, Flash. But yeah. even, even Flash, which, you know, obviously is the, the weakest mm-hmm. of the bunch, I you know, I, I still enjoyed uh, yeah. much of it. So not a bad <laughs> week. And even in my Patreon book I enjoyed, so... Uh, yeah. I, I can't uh, fault my reading experience this week as, as smaller as it may have been, but hey, at least it was the week with the solicits. That's always nice when that that matches up. So looking ahead till next week then, and what's coming Oof. out? Oh, I've went two weeks ahead. Sorry, that's my bad. All right, we have Detective Comics one thousand thirty eight. We have Action Comics one thousand thirty two. Justice League sixty three. Wonder Woman seven seven four. Superman thirty two. That's right. Superman was meant to be week one and or week two and got pushed to this week. Yeah. Uh, Batman Superman 19, Robin issue 3, Infinite Frontier issue 1, so our big event kicks off uh, next week. So that's cool. Exciting. Harley Quinn issue 4, Teen Titans Academy issue 4, Batman Reptilian issue 1. Oh, I'm looking forward to that. Checkmate! How many books are next week? Checkmate issue 1. I'm excited for that too. Uh, okay, I'm just going to say it right now. Mr. Miracle, the Source of Freedom, might be getting dropped. <laughs> It's getting. Cut. I'm. I'm telling you right now. I'm not reading it. Not with all of these. Other. Yeah. It was already on shaky ground, and then you drop, action and Superman and Justice League, right? Infinite Frontier and Robin, Wonder Woman, 
Retellion and Checkmate. I mean, that's a yeah. lot of things. Yeah. That's a lot of things. Uh, Wonder Woman Black and Gold issue 1 is out as well. Uh, yeah, good luck getting red uh, with this list. Uh, Dreaming Waking Hours issue 11 and Ruby Just League issue 3. So, um, yeah. So, this is a busy Wait. week. But some big new things as I well. I almost might have to cut Batman Superman. But I can't because they're, they're, they're in Western gear. <laughs> also, it's only a couple issues from the end of the run. You may as well. No, I know, I know. I was just saying yeah. that to keep the Western joke in. Yeah. Um, but yeah. Too many books next week. We're going to have to breakneck speed covering them. Uh, There's so many. Sure, we'll see how that goes. Infinite Frontier? We all know how we're going to go long on Infinite Frontier. It's the next big... Hey, just look in the bright side. They did this not on the Solicits week. This could have been really bad. See if Solicits sure. were the same week as last time. That could have been a really long episode. So, at least next week it should be just the books. Yeah. And Comic Soldier Top 10, of course. Don't worry, well, folks. Or, or they couldn't push any to the next week where <laughs> it's only annuals? <laughs> DC, DC just messing with us now. They're just messing with us. Uh, but that's what's coming next week. So, big week next week. Uh, maybe the Ginger Menace will have returned. Uh, mm -hmm. Maybe not. I actually don't know if, we, if he knows what his schedule is next week yet. But uh, regardless, you'll see us here on Comics from the Multiverse. Uh, I will take this time to thank you. Thank you to thank you to thank our patrons. If I could speak properly. Uh, I need food. It's been too long. <laughs> I need food. So yeah, I'll take this time to thank our patrons. Uh, our patron producers specifically. Although thank you to all our patrons. But our patron producers who get the credit. Uh, Tyler Hess, Cindy Palacios, David Short, Bordnow, Al Treisman, Christopher Moy, David Brown, and Stanley. Thank you to you all for Stan being Lee. Stanley. To Patreon producers uh, who are all obviously one of the higher tiers. But thank you to our patrons and thank you to everyone who listens or watches the show. Uh, of, of all of you are are wonderful. Um, and if you're on the YouTube channel watching the video version, remember to like and subscribe and all the usual things. Uh, it does help out the YouTube channel grow if you do that. Um, and maybe watch some of the old things that are there, some of the old reviews that are cut up for your convenient playlisting pleasure. Uh, that's what people do, right? Playlisting pleasure. Uh, so go do all that. If you're on iTunes or wherever you get your podcast from, give us a rating on there, five stars with a nice review. All of that does help us as well. Get us on Twitter at DC Comics Podcast, and you can share us out there or ask us questions, whatever it may be. Uh, but thank you once again for watching or listening. We always appreciate it. Keep reading DC Comics. And always remember to never get lost in the Speed Force.